Pana sinus, which was managed with covered stent post stenting no endolic scene. Two of our patients had persistent endolic was managed by repeated balloon inflation. If the endolic persists, balloon should be targeted at the endolic side by partially moving the balloon forward or backward so that the main body, not the tip or end of the balloon is located at the endolic side, to overcome to some extent by the use of triaxial support system. With this technique, it is possible to bring the covered stent to the level where the fistulas are located, provided there is favorable anatomy. Uh, Conclude, uh, we concluded covered stents are uh, evolving as a promising intracranial therapeutic alternative to treat the CCF and preserve the parent artery by reconstructing the arterial wall. It should be considered in patient in home fistula cannot be successfully occluded with detachable bal balloons or detachable coils. The navigation of balloon expandable covered stents in the intracranial circulation can be challenging. This limitation can be minimized by appropriately selecting the patient and by using a stable access system. Although costs of uh, covered stents are much less, but they are equally effective. Uh, this is the pre-op and post-op image of one of our patients. Thank you. Questions from the audience? Okay. The sizes, you use the same covered stent, same sizes in all of your five cases. Do, do, uh, are other sizes not available or you require the same sizes in all? Does the follow-up come into it? Uh, sir, uh, we have seen all five cases uh, for six months, uh, at least six month follow-up. And no, I mean uh, in one uh, patient, uh, uh, we have seen endolic. Because the title, the, fistula side. the title of your talk implicates that you are telling us about the economic impact. W what, is, what exactly is uh, different in cost? Uh, sir, uh, uh, the cost of uh, flow diverter and uh, coils used in uh, management of CCF are much uh, costly. Uh, we use cover distance, which are... Uh, uh, which, uh, so you are saying that it is quite significant? Very, very uh, large difference between uh, uh, sir, uh, these two. Uh, sir, a long follow-up and uh, more number of cases are required to uh, comment over that. Thank you. Decompression for the management of trigeminal neuralgia, our institutional experience of various novel techniques. So trigeminal neuralgia is a debit flicked. Patients excluded were those with tumors, post-traumatic patients, neurological disorders, and patients more than 75 years old who were clinically morbid and not fit for surgery. Principles, uh, we operated in a posterior retrosigmoid craniotomy in a lateral semi-sitting position. The key steps were to open the cisterna magna, identify the fifth nerve, separate the conflict, and then most importantly, maintaining that separation. There are two techniques which are used. One is an inter techniques. First is a Teflon uh, bangle technique where we just uh, wrap the Teflon around the offending vessel, around the nerve, so that the vessel is separated from it. This is how it looks on a cross section. The indications are mainly for short vessels and those vessels that are close to the Meckel's cave. The next is a sling technique where there is a lazy loop of vessel which is covered around the nerve. So we cannot place anything in between. So we sling it and hitch it and attach it to the dura. Then depending on how much is required, we can have one Teflon, two or three. Mostly three are used. The second is a transposition technique where uh, initial steps again remain the same. Here we use a silicon sling which we do not use anymore. However, uh, we used it initially. We sling it around the offending vessel, then we uh, take it up and then it is hitched to the dura. The third is a pericardial patch where uh, this is also a type of transposition technique. The pericardial patch is cut into a rectangular strip. It is placed around the vessel and it is uh, looped up, then it is uh, secured with a clip or a suture, and then it is uh, hitched up to the dura. So this was one of the complications that we had, it was a Tefron granuloma. A patient was operated in 2012 and then came to us with recurrence. Patient had pain along the same site of surgery. 
what happened was that the Teflon was not prepared into a pledget or a bangle. The block of Teflon was just placed as it is. It's a relatively, it's a rare complication, text graft. Then it is uh, looped around the vessel. However, there was uh, a patient had a lot of pain, so in we did a Gore-Tex transposition technique where the vessel was slinged up. After that, we also placed a Teflon pledge, a uh, Teflon bangle around the nerve. So in our experience, we did 45 patients in the last five years. The most common age group were 30 to 40. Uh, female males were affected mostly. There were 26. The duration of symptoms from the onset, the patient had the first symptom to when he presented was most uh, one to five years. Most common affected vessel in our study was a superior cerebellar artery, which was 56% of patients, 16 cases. So number of cases, again, uh, as I said before, the bangle technique is when we wrap a Teflon around the nerve, we use two rings, three rings, and four rings of Teflon, depending on how much of Teflon is needed. Most common, mostly we did a three ring Teflon. And the sling technique, you have various uh, materials that can be used, silicon, Gore-Tex, or pericardium. Silicon we do not use anymore because it slips away. Between Gore-Tex and pericardium, pericardium is relatively better because it causes more adhens, uh, fibrosions, fibrosis, sorry, in the post-op period. However, it is expensive and not that easily available. Mostly we use Gore-Tex, which also has no memory. It also causes good uh, post-op fibrosis and uh, good uh, and recurrence rates are minimal when we do the sling technique. So to conclude, uh, the most, the most significant complaint that patients of trigeminal and Nilaje have is pain. Despite medical treatment, they do not get relief. So a prolonged pain-free period is the, of utmost challenge. Refinement of the genetas technique in recent tech, uh, recent areas have uh, made the operation safer. The transposition technique, where we just sling the offending vessel, has resulted in decreased chances of recurrence, redo surgery, more pain relief. We can also do a combination of the transposition and the interposition technique that can be used for patients for trigeminal neuralgia. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you very much. Hello. Hello. How many of veins you put uh, the sling? Sir, pardon? How many, in, how many cases you put uh, sling in vein, vein? Sir, not many, sir, but uh, the vi video have shown of an arterial compression only, sir. Okay. Any questions from yeah. audience? Yeah. Hmm. What are the signs of primary trigeminal neuralgia? Sir, patient has lancinating pain along the V2, V3 segments of the nerve. I asked, what are the signs of primary trigeminal neuralgia? Signs. So pain. So the patient comes to OPD holding their hand like this, and you can just see that. Yes. So considering sling is a good technique, put a. Uh, Teflon bangle around the nerve. So, I mean, like, and if you have prone, like you had some granuloma cases, so if you could put the sling, why you have put, you go, uh, like, why you have put the bangle? So, the bangle we used to do initially, and then once we started doing the sling surgery, we got good results for it. So, we uh, do not do bangle, except for cases when there is a very short vessel uh, and it cannot be slinged, and only those cases we do a bangle. So, mostly we just do a sling procedure. Okay, one of the cases you have done both, like, you are nicely put a sling and then put a bangle. That's all. Thank you. I have a couple of questions. Beautifully done, mobilized excellently. It's not that easy. Questions. Beautifully done, mobilized excellently. It's not that easy. What type of suture and needle do you use for fixing it, number one? And did you sacrifice any veins in the course to mobilize? And what was your approach to dual compression, both arterial and venous? So, uh, what was the last question? What was your approach to the cases having dual compression, both arterial as well as venous compression? And did you sacrifice any veins, small veins, in order to mobilize suture needle you used? Sir, pardon? Type of suture and a needle, any special needle you were using for fixing? What type of suture? 3040, 50, uh, Sir, we use a normal needle only. We use the 80 or 90 suture for fixing. Thank you. like to call
Now open the session two. We have five papers. Firstly, please give your presentation on time, please. The first speaker is Dr. Suniru from Bangalore. Uh, topics is scope, scope and the benefit of a dual trained neurosurgeon. Could you start your lecture? Thank you um, for this uh, opportunity. So a dual trained neurosurgeon is a neurosurgeon with both uh, open and endovascular training. Uh, as we all know that uh, another aneurysm in the anterior communicating region, it is a little complex, so we had to balloon assist coil this case. But not all aneurysms should be uh, coiled. This is uh, an MCA bifurcation aneurysm. Um, this I would actually go for uh, clipping. This is most of the MCA or anterior communicating artery aneurysms are eminently clipped than coiled. But posterior circulation aneurysms are a different ball game. You have this dissecting aneurysm in the upper basilar with uh, bleed and strokes. So what we did was we put a flow divert across this and at the end of six months you have very good, uh, recan re very good reconstruction of the basilar artery. The same thing with dissecting aneurysms in the posterior circulation of course are better uh, treated by parent vessel sacrifice if possible. Um, there's a paradigm shift in the management of uh, giant aneurysms especially uh, cavernous segment supraclinal aneurysms. Uh, flow diversion has really helped. You can see the stasis very early in all these cases. Uh, you can, in this run, you can see that there is consta contrast stagnation, which is already developed after deploying the flow diverter. Blister aneurysms, again, very difficult uh, to treat them. Um, there's a high chance of rupture or even with either surgery or with, uh, with the flow diversion. So in this case, we placed a flow diverter in this ruptured blister aneurysm. Posterior circulation, a large uh, giant aneurysms, we uh, put a flow diverter and placed it for either. Uh, as a dual trained neurosurgeon, we are best adept to selecting the best approach based on these for these patients. Um, and you can have a very good outcome, especially in young individuals with carotid endarterectomy. Uh, stenting is also very good. Posterior circulation, uh, if you have a high-grade stenosis with repeated TIs, there's no option but to stent these cases. This is a case which we did recently. We balloon plasty the oh, yeah. basilar artery and then place a stent across the oh, mid basilar. CCF, we already seen this. Uh, there's the best method to treat this is by the endovascular technique. Uh, Moimai disease, it, it gives great uh, pleasure for a neurosurgeon to evaluate the patient from start to scra from scratch and to treat them, uh, study the angios, see what you want to look at in the angiograms, do a good bypass and see the fruits of your labor by doing an angiogram in the post-operative period. AVMs, large AVMs which have bled, uh, you do a embolization, get a good cast, make it as avascular as possible, decide to operate for Cushing's, do the IPSS yourself, get your recordings and you know where to go. We always need to clean what we do, sometimes not always uh, things go the way we want, so as a neurosurgeon you embolize an a AVM, probably the embolic material went into the uh, venous system and the AVM was not well uh, completely embolized, so they had a venous bleed. You do a good thrombectomy, not all thrombectomies improve like I show, some of them present late. Uh, they already have a lot of changes, so a decompression is warranted. So during my residency, there was always a debate, open versus uh, endovascular, but I was surprised by this article which came out in 2018, what Dr. Mehta said, to my mind, a person dealing with these type of aneurysms is the one who has the expertise in both micro- I think some of them you are a trained neurosurgeon, no demerit, only benefit. <laughs> um, probably um, the demerits would uh, be with respect to hardly any actually. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay, thank you, next presentation. We have not enough time. We want to move you. to the next speaker. Rupture and often they are a giant microsurgical management. Both are having their own advantages and disadvantages. So rather than considering microsurgery or endovascular, one has to talk about the microsurgery and endovascular procedures. 
we know microsurgically these lesions upper third located lesions can be best treated by the subtemporal or terrenal approach while the lesion placed in the middle uh, third of this region like best managed with the transpetoral approach and those lesions are located at the pica origin and the vertebral junction can be uh, approached the midline or parietal approaches a basal tip aneurysm consists of 7% of the all intracranial aneurysms uh, and endovascular treatment is the mainstay but there is there are some limitations especially in terms of large and giant aneurysm again like coils only but this uh, patient of uh, subarachnoid hemorrhage presented with the uh, uh, patient was referred from uh, endo, uh, referred from endovascular unit for uh, uh, surgical management and this patient underwent the micro one can uh, identify the neck of the aneurysms safely so now i am dissecting the, the neck between the neck and the uh, right pca and uh, then the temporary clip is being applied and the, the this aneurysm can be safely clipped with the, using a bayonet clip and we always uh, do the post uh, 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 clipping uh, 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 dye study to uh, look for the perforations. One can see this moya moya disease with, uh, with patient having only one uh, uh, vertebral artery that was supplying the entire circulation. In this patient, uh, uh, we have managed with the coil alone because in some in this patient's microsurgery sometimes create a catastrophe. Uh, this uh, uh, again, like uh, this uh, uh, small PCA aneurysm, one can see the PCA segment aneurysm that uh, that was the neck was against the flow of the direction. We actually tried for the endovascular uh, uh, endovascularly put the uh, coils inside the aneurysm, but we were not able to put the. Oh, I'm extremely sorry for that. Uh, of a superior cerebral artery can be safely coiled like this uh, case, but uh, many a times uh, it is uh, uh, not uh, 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 not uh, financially viable. Uh, uh, dissecting aneurysm in a young patient who present with a subarachnoid hemorrhage, uh, there is no other alternative technique in nowadays. One has to think about the endovascular only, and this patient underwent the uh, flow diverter treatment. Uh, one can see the stagnation of the placement of the flow diverter, and there was a significant, uh, uh, you can see that the complete disappearance of the aneurysm over a period of six months follow-up. Vertebrobasilar junction aneurysms are rare, and uh, this uh, fusiform uh, vertebrobasilar junction, they are very small. Uh, always, there is a, uh, always there is a confusion in the, in the case of the pica when patient demands, you always plan for uh, uh, endovascular, but uh, many a times uh, we uh, prefer endo uh, microsurgical treatment for this, but uh, many a times uh, we uh, prefer endo uh, microsurgical treatment for this uh, aneurysms. Like the time in a case of this aneurysm, one has to use a temporary clip. Time in a case of this aneurysm, one has to use a temporary clip. So, so that this aneurysm was clipped, and we always uh, consider uh, uh, we use ICG as well as the intraprocedural Doppler confirm the uh, uh, com uh, com uh, complete uh, uh, ex uh, exclusion of the aneurysm from the circulation. And uh, this is the post-operative uh, angiogram, uh, post-operative hemorrhage with the dilatory hemorrhage with the deleterious consequences. They are difficult to approach this lesion because of the critical structure. Uh, advance is endovascular technique is because uh, because of that it's a preferred method of choice however the microsurgical techniques still have a paramount role in many of these aneurysms thank you yeah uh, very eloquent talk with the centromere this is the centromere uh, <coughs> polymorphism so again basis of genetics we all know that uh, adenine uh, uh, combines with thionine guanine combines with cytosine so if there is single nucleotide uh, replacement by for example in this slide by g by a 
So this is known as a SNP. Uh, this is read as a SNP or singulonucleotide polymorphism. This may not be clinically significant or this may be clinically significant. This is known as SNP if 1% of the total population is involved. And this part, this uh, morphology and this morphology will be known as alleles. This is allele 1, this is allele 2. They may not be clinically significant, they may be clinically significant. So for present study, what we did was on chromosome 9, on location 9P21 sublocation 3, we found out, we tried 35 cases and 35 controls. So uh, blood was taken at the time of uh, their entry into the hospital. DNA was extracted by some technique which my, my uh, basic science are more, uh, prone, uh, more uh, uh, familiar with that. RT-PCR was done. And then something called uh, AD plot was done, which is called allelic discrimination plot. So the red ones are the uh, homozygous alleles. That is, they are normal patients. So, and uh, the green one are the heterozygous, means one of the genes, uh, out of two chromosomes, one is involved. Uh, blue is that both are involved. <coughs> so these are my results. This slide I can skip, the, that's just the incidence wise. So this I'll come. Now what we found in the results of genetic mutation. Out of 35 cases, 20, uh, 9 patients had mutation, but in controls only one patient had mutation. This was uh, statistically significant with an odds ratio of nearly uh, more than 11. So any patient having this mutation has a, and a uh, few other steps which involve tumor apoptosis. A lot number of non-malignant diseases are also associated with that. So if we, if we combine all these diseases, so what is the common uh, etiology or common uh, pathogenesis, uh, three, four common pathogenesis, one is lipid and carbohydrate metabolism and inflammation. So how does it translate into aneurysm? We all know that ruptured aneurysms at least have uh, something uh, inflammatory uh, component uh, in the, uh, what we see in the vessel wall imaging and atherosclerosis gradually weakens the uh, wall of the aneurysm leading to an aneurysm formation. So something to do with inflammation and lipid and carbohydrate metabolism which leads to atherosclerosis. So does it actually translate into a clinical neurosurgery or will it translate after say let us say one decade or whatever. So two neighboring genes of this gene, this gene we identified, two neighboring genes of this um, uh, labeled as P15, INK4B and INK4A, they, pro they help in <coughs> vessel wall remodeling and again atherosclerotic formation. So again, we know that uh, aneurysm uh, is an interplay between inflammation, atherosclerosis, vessel wall is called a vaccine. So after that vaccine, everything has been abated. So they're called a vaccine. So after that vaccine, everything has been abated. So there is no need for that. And uh, so can we, can we reach that level in aneurysm uh, surgery or aneurysm uh, with the uh, incidence of uh, multiple with the uh, incidence of uh, multiple aneurysms no. because uh, so we, uh, we, we saw it we, we uh, all 35 aneurysms uh, there were almost 13 aneurysms which were multiple but that's more than one so we did not find any relation whether mutation was present or not the multiplicity of aneurysm was not we did not uh, find anything don't you find it uh, slightly difficult to ex explain the uh, absence of multiplicity but the presence of genes? No. Why? Because I'll tell you. Suppose there is single... ...is uh, better than cure. So uh, in uh, your cases, uh, basically, did you use any other samples apart from uh, the blood you have used for genetic analysis? Like, I know that in Boya Boya disease, you used to use some muscle samples also. So has it been the case? Uh, studies are going on, one has been completed, so in that we are uh, taking that... Uh Evaluate in common population to know that this is the uh, gene positive patient, so we have to observe. This is the important thing for us. So, so if you ask me, this, this will be my um, life goal, that uh, uh, almost now 40 genes have been, uh, more than 40 genes have been discovered. So this, this gene we chose because of two reasons. One was simple logistics because this was the um, uh, cheapest one which we could do in our center. And the second was that uh, this gene was not studied in India per se, but in Asia by a Japanese, uh, there is a Japanese cohort population which was studied. So we thought that since we are Asian descendants, probably we will find this gene more. So answering your question directly, Probably, it is something like, let us say for example, like in Japan, I, which, what I understand is that they will do CT angiography for every individual after some age, I don't know, probably 50. So to pick up early cases of aneurysm. So I always uh, equate it with this thing with, uh, with something like PSA. So like, like, like I'm reaching 50, so I'll get my PSA done after 50. 
So the same thing, let us, let us have a gene panel of these seven, eight, ten genes which are commonly associated with, let us say, Northwest India or your part, Eastern part of the country. So those genes can be picked up in an individual and then we know that this family is my ultimate goal. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Dr. Ashish, uh, for that great talk. I would like to invite uh, Dr. Vernon Velo from Mumbai again. Uh, his topic will be management of complex MCI aneurysms. Thank you. Thank you, Chairpersons. I'd like to thank and congratulate uh, Dr. Daljeet, Dr. Anita, and Dr. Arvind. Anatomy, you have to know the anatomy of the MCA from M1 to M4, how it uh, spreads and how to attack these aneurysms, especially when they are midway between the M1 and the M4. And you've got to know the arterial supply well so that you can also preserve the perforators. Now, this is the new classification by Professor Kato, and uh, I think Professor Kano, Asano is also here. I did my training in Fujita, and I learned my aneurysm surgery from him. This is a very simple classification. Starts from type 1 and goes to type 5, and if you see here, the worst one is the blister aneurysm, however big or however small it is. So what do you require for these uh, aneurysms? You require the CT, you require to evaluate the grade of SAH. Sometimes they present with an ICH. 3D CT angio is beautiful. And of course, intraoperative proximal as well as distal control of these aneurysms. So the different types of clipping, simple, multiple, clip reconstruction, tandem clipping, fenestrated clipping, and uh, you can manage many aneurysms just by using the clips the way they can be used. So the points to consider is sharp dissection everywhere. Uh, Sylvian dissection is the goal, complete Sylvian dissection. Beware of small uh, branches which are adherent to the dome and also the clip application technique is important. The type of clip you choose is important. And temporary clip application should be three minutes gap. You keep it for three minutes, remove it, keep it for three minutes, remove it, and it is not a continuous clip application. So just to show you some examples, this is a large aneurysm. So we, uh, mostly we see ruptured aneurysms. So this is a patient where we use a fairly larger flap. We do not compromise on the craniotomy. So the sylvian dissection is very important. We do not use retractors as far as possible. So here there was a doubtful ACOM. So I'm checking it out with the fluorescein angio here. And then we're going towards the MCA, taking a temporary clip on the MCA. This is a large aneurysm, so you have to go on board. and identifying the main vessel, so fluorescein angiography. That's the post-op DSA, post-op scan. This is another patient, large blowout. So we mostly see this, and sometimes you have to evacuate this clot also. Again, complete sylvian dissection, and you got to have proximal control. You see the vessel is atherosclerosed, cutting the lumen, that's the ICG. It's supposed to, we had to remove the bone flap in view of the clot here. It's good to get around the whole sac. So that you can identify all the perforators. removing the temporary clip. And then one can go for the A1 on the opposite side, pre-op, post-op. A lot of cases, but due to want of time, I will not be able to show it. So basic thing is to get good proximal control, open the sylvan fissure wide. and take your time to dissect. So I will move to the next speaker. Thank you so much. Uh, final speaker is Dr. Suresh from Chimbatu. Please. I go with a few case reports, like 60 years old gentleman with WFNS grade two. We can see this is a ACOM aneurysm. Of course, everybody's dream is to have this kind of cases. We can see both A1A2 and opposite A1A2, and nice clipping, and we can see the 
A comes segments with this A1, A2 junction aneurysm. Of course, in property YCG, so all the vessels are preserved rather than the, not only the occlusion of the aneurysm. But not all cases will be like that. This patient presented with the right sylvian bleed, both the MR and the CT scan showed the same. Right carotid injection showed a right MC aneurysm with a cluster of vessels in the ACOM region. The right injection is filling the left side as well. Left, there is a total carotid block. So we can see the aneurysm wide neck with A1 with maybe the rudimentary one. You can see it's a 8 millimeter with the incorporation of both A2 there. So with this, uh, we're putting the temporary clip on the A1 and just uh, gyrus resection done and we are trying to get the both A2s and the dissection is made there and uh, we're just proceeding to the clip. And after the clip, go around the fundus and uh, look for any other perforators or any other vessels in there. And we puncture the aneurysm and fuse it and try to make sure everything is okay with the intraoperative ICG. Not only that, because A2 is coming in the way. So better to go on the right side with the open fork approach. That's what we did. This is a A1, but if we carefully look into it, it's going down. That is just continuation of the A1 with the aneurysm here. And we have to look for the opposite A1 there. That is there. So the Otherwise, we may think that this is a A2 and uh, try to find all the aneurysm over there. So we have, sorry. So we use the clip, try to uh, dissect nicely. And uh, we, we have seen the A2 here to uh, dissect nicely. And uh, we, we have seen the A2 here. And put a clip. There is a pseudo aneurysm also. So, so A2 we can see here and opposite side A1 and A2. This is the post-op image. Not only that, it, it, sometimes when we are looking for the ACOM aneurysm which has blood, we will see small aneurysms on the way. This is the, when we do the sylvian dissection, there is a blub in the MCA which needs to be tackled, of course, after the ACOM aneurysm. This also we should be prepared when we go in. We go for a MC aneurysm. This is a 57 years old lady with a grade 2 WFNC monitoring. This gentleman presented with just a headache. There is no subarachnoid hemorrhage. You can see a large aneurysm buried into the sylvian fissure. So just only the photographs I will show. This is a surgical position. You can see the M1 and both M2 is coming right away and wide sylvian dissection and look for the vessels this is m1 and these two are the m2 we just put a temporary clip on the m1 and put two clips and start puncturing the aneurysm as well as the cauterization of the vessel sorry aneurysm and put a three clips this is a reconstruction of the neck also has been done this 32 years old gentleman present with the neck pain and the shoulder pain. You can see the left pica aneurysm with right MC aneurysm. The culprit is a pica aneurysm. It has been coiled. After two months, patient come back for the MC aneurysm. You can see this just distal to the bifurcation of the um, uh, ICA. So we have to be very careful. You see, this just when we retract the uh, aneurysm, it's quite large. So this is the CT angio. You can see ICA, A1, and MCA. We put the clip all across and the operative period, and then actually you can uh, experience the surgery before going act yeah. into the uh, actual surgery, okay. and then uh, go ahead and do. So that is also a uh, new thing. So it's great. Yeah. Thank you. Any questions from the audience? We have time for a question. Small comment. Yes. So that uh, pre-op uh, get. get no. uh, thank you, Dr. Dakizawa and Dr. Ramesh. We move on to the next session, and I request uh, Dr. Vernon Vello, my co-chair, and uh, Dr. T. D. Single, the moderator of the session, to please come up on the stage and start the session. Uh, Dr. Vernon and Dr. G. D. 
one related to the medulla, one around the tonsils, with uh, segments that is known to all of you, with the first three segments giving uh, uh, important perforators and supply to the medulla, and then the cortical branches continue through the morphology, but we have a concentration on the location whether the aneurysms come from the vertebral pica junction or more distally on the artery. And uh, if we look at the uh, posterior fossa, the lower CP angle or most or more precisely the medullary cerebellar uh, fissure is near the midline uh, because it's funnel shaped so you can approach lower down uh, near the midline either from a midline or a lateral approach. And uh, the apex of, the, of that will be the jugular tubercle which is a part of the condylar part of the occipital bone as the, uh, the condylar part is uh, divided by the hypoglossal canal into the occipital condyle and more superiorly the jugular tubercle with the vertebral going around the lateral mass of C1. And this is what the jugular tubercle that obscure you intradurally. And uh, this is the division by the hypoglossal canal, the perforators. The size is not as important, but it requires a bigger um, expo exposure and the pica is related to the cranial nerves as we all know. Uh, as, you, as even higher up, you need to have a trajectory that goes even more anterior and superior. So the dilemmas, as I said, is which approach we use and uh, what to do with the occipital condyle, if any. So for the trajectory, if you have uh, a lesion near the foramen magnum, so the midline approach provides a trajectory looking from medial to lateral, and it's very good to exposure while as itself. While, uh, of course, this is not appropriate for a more anterior, you need a far lateral approach for that. For anything that is on the other segments distally on the pica, of course, it is self-explanatory to do a midline approach, such as this case uh, on, on around the tonsils, and, um, and the aneurysm is clipped. Higher up, you really need a far lateral approach. You don't need the condyle at all because it's higher than that. Than that. You may need uh, for the ones on the, uh, on the condyle uh, and the joint to make sure that you are far enough. So the whole idea of exposing the condyle, not to remove it, but to make sure that the foramen, there is no indication to drill the condyle, you may need to reduce the jugular tubercle in once, and simply that um, uh, doing a midline uh, approach for the lower one near the foramen magnum obviates the need to drill the condyle, even if you know how to drill it the and it is the jugular tubercle that is important. So again, just to remind you, simplicity is the key. Do not perform a procedure, and Professor Liu Hain and CME used to tell us that this long presentation just not drill it unnecessarily. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Thank you. We can accommodate only one question because of time constraints. Any comments? Uh, uh, Dr. Ramesh, uh, I have a question. How would you decide to go in the midline or to go laterally? Because now most of the times you can get the pica aneurysms through midline. Yes. What I do is I go midline and then I open the dura laterally. Yes. Uh, so the, the midline approach is still open the foramen magnum to the condyle, but it's the trajectory, the, the view. If you see on the angiogram that the, the pica is leaving the vertebral near the vertebral basal junction, the, the brain stem and the medulla is on the way. So you need a lateral approach. You need to position the patient lateral and uh, make the craniotomy just lateral, not a midline. So it's the, the angle of view that is important. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Dr. ...under very high magnification because the diameter of the vessels are very small. Uh, section 1 is for Penrose drain. Section 2 is for plastic tube. Section 3 is for chicken vessel anastomosis. And section four is for uh, live uh, anesthetized rat. So uh, what are the equipments and instruments that is needed? Just a basic uh, stereo microscope, table mounted, and a, a handful of uh, I instruments like jewelers, forceps, scissor, uh, needle holder, and a vessel dilator. So uh, with the Penrose needle entry and exit uh, are equivalent, I mean equidistant uh, from the margin. Also, there has to be uh, a, a equidistance between these uh, sutures. 
and there is there are various parameters that we need uh, to take in of doing a real bypass then comes the net uh, rat vessel anastomosis where the anesthetized rat carotid artery is anastomosed however this may not be available at uh, every place so uh, uh, along with dr baskaya we try to develop a medical a medicine objective self assessment tool wherein uh, we uh, measure the after at the end of suturing we measure the distance between the sutures the length of the suture the quality of the needle also uh, after doing end to end end to side and side to side anastomosis again all the same parameters are checked at the end of chicken vessel thigh suturing uh, we open cut open the uh, the vessel and try to see if there is any back vessel biting there or not so uh, i'll just share you a small video of my first bypass which i performed last year and and as you see here and as you see here after putting a mini clip there was a twisting of the vessel so again i struggled a lot and ultimately i could achieve it so fish mouthing of the donor vessel is done and here i just want to share this after taking a bite through this there was a jerk here we should try to avoid this movement and first the front wall uh, interrupted suturing was done and once it is done the vessel is uh, flipped and the interrupted wall suturing was done on the back side so once the entire suturing is done i removed the clips and the bypass was looking okay and it was confirmed with icg so uh, uh, as we all know that the indications of bypasses are like moya moya disease giant aneurysms and uh, few skull based tumors where we need to sacrifice the parent artery however there are expanding indications uh, which was published recently so to conclude with learning bypass surgery the training for bypass includes performing the different suturing techniques repeatedly i feel all the institutes should have the facility where basic microvascular anastomosis training can be given to the residents and should include this as a part of our neurosurgery residency curriculum and we should also try to develop the objective assessment tool after suturing to assess whether this was performed adequately or not thank you thank you dr jayun any question or comment yeah please Oh, thank you for the nice uh, lecture. I, I have one comment. Okay, bypass surgery is uh, occlusion time is very important to avoid yeah. ischemic complication. Okay, yeah. you uh, perform the trimming of the donor after temporary occlusion of the recipient, right? Right. Yeah. So yeah. my uh, comment is uh, you should uh, everything. Okay. Yeah. Opposite. Okay. okay? Yeah. You should avoid the temporary occlusion right. trimming. Well, suture only donor side, okay. then start occlusion. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Jayun. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we move on to the next speaker, uh, Dr. Kamlesh Paswara from SGPJ Lucknow. And he shall be talking about Moya Moya disease, his experience with the unilateral disease. Thank you, organizers, for giving me opportunity. Uh, lots of uh, good uh, talks uh, I have been listening from morning on Moya Moya disease. This is my uh, basic, uh, this is the typical Moya Moya what we usually say. The eight year old female who had presented weakness in left upper limb with focal motor seizure, MRI showing the infarct in left, uh, right frontal lobe. DSA is suggestive of bilateral supraclonal IC and stenosis, Moya Moya vessels. And perfusion study shows hypoperfusion on both sides. So we planned surgery on right side first, as it was a symptomatic hemisphere. This is the basic surgery, harvesting of STA, adequate length of STA being har harvested, hypernizing, hypernizing the donor, and looking for size and redundancy of, redundancy of donor at recipient side. There's some RTOT being done according to size of uh, donor. 
heel and knee uh, sutures are being placed to anchor the recipient vessel on your artery and this is the usual surgery we usually do interrupted sutures anterior wall suturing posterior wall suturing checking the bypass or removing the temporary clips this bypass and after that doing interop angiography to look for patency of bypass this is a, a basic uh, stmc bypass surgery i am after that the other other hemisphere of this child was operated uh, post operatively uh, after first surgery the uh, perfusion on right side improved child became asymptomatic and post op ngo and uh, top mri shows good functioning bypass and improved perfusion on right side but uh, this patient is also gone stmc bypass which was improved uh, on post op uh, post operative period on that, that side but what we have gone back so what are the guidelines to diagnose the myo moya moya disease which which which, you, which you commonly show that is bilateral disease we see cerebral angiography supraclinoid ic block abnormal moya moya vessel and bilaterality which was our conventional teaching which we call is it moya moya disease <coughs> and when we have underlying disease which causing moya moya we call it moya moya syndrome which can be unilateral guidelines have been redefined uh, recently now this pro contralateral progression with moya moya syndrome is more if moya moya syndrome is one side and uh, the probability of happening on other side is around of 30% which has been can be reported of the in the literature average time of progression for moya moya syndrome is around 2.2 years in contralateral side <coughs> sir and what are the uh, radiological various characteristics have been defined for this moya moya uh, unilateral moya moya literature it is discovered this is, this may be a different phenotype of same genetic bar aca aca feeders and con on contralateral side the perfusion was perfectly all right there was normal ica and which are supporting on contralateral half of the uh, brain also so this patient was a, was moya moya uh, unilateral moya moya with evm when these unilateral disease with uh, yeah any uh, associative any other abnormality this or the dilemma increases so the uh, the dilemma is who came first moya moya leading to evm formation or evm leading to moya moya both has been described in the literature both these diseases can lead to one another the avm can lead to moya moya formation due to high demand and proximal uh, vessel uh, dysplasia leading to uh, proximal artery stenosis which can contrary can lead to the uh, mo uh, deployment of moya moya vessels and uh, and <coughs> avm can also lead to, can uh, have been have been byproduct of moya moya disease due to as we all know moya moya have high tendency to uh, secrete uh, various vascular factors which can lead to moya moya uh, development in uh, future and these finding uh, these two finding can be coincidental also so how to treat these when they are associated with moya moya this patient we have uh, done stmc bypass on symptomatic side we are observing the patient hopefully the patient will undergo gamma knife for avm to conclude unilateral moya moya disease is a poorly defined entire in literature reduced blood flow more have and more these patient have more chances of ischemia symptomatic side should be treated with bypass direct or indirect contralateral progression is reported in, in 8 to 10% of cases so non invasive screening should be recommended for non uh, involved side early any associate lesion should be treated according to presentation of the patient thank you and i would like to invite any to comment and what is called this conference any comment or questions then we move on next speaker Dr. Madhukar T. Nayak from Bangalore. So, good morning, chairpersons. As the onset, I would like to thank uh, Daljit sir and Anita madam for give, having given me this opportunity to share my experience here. So, my disclosure is that most of this work, which, which I am presenting, was which I did in Mangalore at Fathamulla Medical College, where I worked for last 11 years, and since last year I have moved to Mumbai.
sorry for the yeah. so when we come across aneurysm clipping or calling this has been a contentious issue we as neurosurgeons i personally still feel that if the patient is young and if it is feasible clipping is an option because once we tackle the neck and it is virtually full proof there is no risk of recurrence however as a neuro interventionist when i mean uh, when we are uh, the patient is presented that why you need to open the skull for this and the risk of retraction and handling of the perforators so over the last 12 to 15 years from being a staunch open neurosurgeon to a reluctant neuro interventionist to a realist empathetic hybrid neurosurgeon this is how has been my journey so i would like to just share my humble experience so for the sake of discussion i have classified this into clinical radiological and socio economic factors so age being a criteria when of course if it is a younger patient and if the patient is willing i would suggest uh, open surgery but if there are comorbidities and uh, other stuff then neuro intervention being a shorter and straight forward procedure that would be ideal but if there is say for example a lower hematoma or hydrocephalus and if you have to as well go in and tackle that why not clip the aneurysm but the other way to look at is why not secure the aneurysm endovascularly and then do a targeted approach maybe an endoscopic third ventriculostomy or uh, if it is a uh, communicating hydrocephalus why not do an um, uh, lumbar drainage or a targeted craniotomy and evacuate the hematoma radiologically relative factors difficult arch initially at least in the, in the initial stages it might be if it's a type 3 arch it might be difficult so and if there is a proximal artery occlusion if there are wide neck aneurysms then maybe you might have to use other neck support devices and if there are if there is recurrent coil compactions or if there is a perforator which is arising from the neck maybe you could just over inflate the balloon to maybe you might just as well go in and uh, put a clip and save the perforators socio economic factors at least in the initial my medical college practice this has been the most important guiding factor because self paying and patient who uh, affordability is an issue and then wfns uh, i mean fisher grade 3 wfns grade 1 a giant large aneurysm so if the if it was now maybe i would have used a neck support device like a contour or maybe a extending with an fd and few coils but this was early days was 10 years ago when i was an open only an open neurosurgeon so i just did a two piece fd oz craniotomy wide opening of the sylvian fissure and half and half approach opening of the sylvian fissure transsylvian and subtemporal approach cutting the tentorium mobilizing the free edge of the tentorium oh, and then exposing the proximal basilar artery plays a temporary clip on the basilar artery and with the very low power bipolar cautery shrink the aneurysm and then place two clip one ring, ring clip encompassing the ipsilateral pca and another clip just distal to the pca and this was the result there was a stormy post operative period but virtually at the end of 3 weeks patient went home so when there is a hematoma if this is a clipping calling both possible but if it as you can see there is some amount of vasospasm in the proximal aca maybe if possible at this juncture i would have suggested clip or coiling but uh, this was again a straight forward procedure placed a single clip and open the lamina terminalis and uh, patient had a good recovery most of the most of the patients which present to us are and at least in my practice are ruptured cases but this was uh, an exception somebody had done for C ct angio brain for headache and they found a p2 pc aneurysm and the patient also referred to us maybe at this juncture like, as you can see that it's the vessel wall itself is diseased and there is a secular outpouching from the fusiform this thing a straight forward thing would be to play, place a flow diverter but that this was an again early days so I, what i did was a craniotomy and a subtemporal approach sub pile resection of the uncles to expose the um, long perforators and trace the long perforators to the pc and then place a temporary clip to delineate the aneurysm and then place two clips and this was the post operative picture as you can see the vessel wall itself is deceased of course i had wrapped it with the muscle also so we'll have to keep a watch on this and if there is again a recurrence then maybe i'll place an fd aneurysm the opposite side one the smaller i think it and we like to do that so basilar aneurysm again this is we did a coiling mca bifurcation you can do clipping also but this we used a triaxial system sometimes neck axis is difficult direct transcarotid approach you might have to do as a simple neck scar there pre calling post calling this is again a proximal cc occlusion was there so we had to use this is a wide neck aneurysm balloon assisted calling we had used the these chinese lepu coils also they were also i mean quite good enough unaffordable patient these are few cases it's quite good enough unaffordable patient these are few cases so last case endovascularly did a 
straightforward job, but patient had severe regulated cerebral ischemia, maybe a silent rupture, so I had to do an endoscopic third ventriculostomy and serial LPs and aggressive triple H therapy and patient went home after two months. So never give up and of course these are the factors which you have to consider and virtually any patient can be treated endovascularly nowadays but a decision making process should have an active informed participation of the relatives so that we will choose what is best for the patient. I thank my mentors for uh, having for because of these are the on to a general strategy and the series of patients that we have uh, accumulated over about 10 11 years um, this is a patient who 74 year old gentleman who presented with this uh, an aparida occipital hemorrhage he had an angiogram that showed uh, to your left you can see uh, that the there's a large dural AV fistula with an isolated transfer sinus there's a reflux into the cortical veins. Our endovascular colleagues uh, could not approach this fistula from the right side through the transfer sinus. So then we ended up doing an access procedure for them, small craniotomy directly over the uh, transfer sinus, and that allowed them to put a catheter in there. The patient underwent extensive coiling of this fistula. So the whole transfer sinus up to the torcula was coiled with really good result, but a follow-up angiogram about one year showed that there was still a torcular component that was still kind of feeding this fistula and draining up into the uh, superior sagittal sinus. So then we decided to take this patient for gamma knife and uh, we targeted that torcular area with gamma knife. And about 16 months later, here had an MRI that showed no uh, early veins on the uh, train of flight imaging. This is the second patient, another 76 year old gentleman who presented with subarachnoid hemorrhage. CT angiogram showed that was coiled by our endovascular colleagues at the time of the time of the angiogram. Again, uh, patient, uh, this was about six months ago, saw the patient, he has a little bit of facial numbness, about 20% loss of sensation on the left side of the face. Other than that, he's completely intact and is fully recovered. And uh, we plan to do an angiogram in about a year. This is the third case that shows, again, uh, fistula from the meningohypophyseal trunk draining into this large venous complex. But it's really just a one point, one vein coming in front of the brain stem. This was uh, coiled by endovascular techniques using a transvenous route. And this is an angiogram about six months later that shows complete resolution of this fistula. So in general, uh, you know, we have uh, several options and we need, uh, we uh, worry about the uh, risk of uh, intracranial hemorrhage, then we can take care of the vein, but, the, but really we have to take care of the sinus too at the same time, and that depends on the anatomy surrounding the dural AV fistula. Uh, oftentimes we are able to take care of the sinus through endovascular procedures or by isolating the sinus in some cases. 60% males, it was a little bit odd. He had presented the symptoms of NPH and on workup was found to have a fairly extensive transfer sinus dural AV fistula. Not sure if that's what led to these symptoms, but he also underwent a shunt as well as a, uh, multiple procedures for his uh, dural AV fistula. Two patients were just incidental findings and one of them was fairly extensive, uh, but completely asymptomatic as far as we could tell. The disconnection in eight. And uh, this shows our uh, agents that we use for endovascular. Follow-up mean was 52.8 months, median 32. And the outcome showed um, no intervention or failed treatment in about 12%, complete obliteration in about 68%. Uh, and in surgery, there was only one patient that about a year or a year and a half later was noted to have a recurrent broadened type 1 fish. Include all the unknown ones, then the mortality was about 9%. Thank you.
hearing all the lectures on neuro, uh, sorry, all the lectures on uh, neurosurgery, we come to the basic anatomy lecture. And I'm uh, honored to be here amongst the doins of neurosurgeon. And I thank the Department of Neurosurgery to give me this lecture to speak on a very basic topic which you would find on the variations of sigmoid sinus. So I'm coming to a very basic topic called what do we understand? So what do we understand by what are dural sinuses? You all are operating and all working on dural sinuses. So let's just see what are they in the complete anatomical term. They are complex necks. You're all well versed with the part cerebri, which is a sickle shaped dural fold attached from the crystalline going from the calvaria on both the sides in the parietal bone coming up to the occipital bone and uh, getting attached to the internal occipital protuberance. Then there, which is separating the two cerebral hemispheres and there is a transverse dura or fold of meninges which is called the tentorium cerebelli. They are all two layers of dura, meningeal dura and in them lie the dural sinuses. So let's look at the dural sinuses. The superior sinusoidal, the sigmoid sinus. So let's just see how the blood flows in the sinuses. So we see the superior sagittal sinus, the surface, the superior surface of the brain, lateral and the medial are all drained by the superior sagittal sinus, while the deeper cortical veins are all draining by the inferior sagittal sinus. So the straight sinus lies in the junction of the phaic cerebri and the tentorium cerebri, and it runs posterior inferiorly as a continuation of the inferior sagittal sinus and drains into the left transfer sinus. So if we look at the right transfer sinus, sylvian fissure joins with the left transfer, transfer sinus, and where they meet the transfer sinus and the sigmoid sinus at their, that junction, we have the superior petrosal sinus. So after learning about the drainage of the blood vessels, of the venous drainage of the blood vessels, we will now come on to this. You can see this is just a surface representing the superior sagittal sinus and the right and left transfer sinus are forming a confluence. And the drainage is by all these vessels. And if we look at the, we try to see the surface projection of the junction between the transfer sinus and the sigmoid sinus. Most of it is at the asterion, which is the junction between the, as it's shown by this blue structured mark, it's between the lambdoid, the occipitomastoid, and the parietomastoid sutures. The relation between the asterion and junctions, that is that I just mentioned, is between the transverse and the sigmoid sinus, and 81% it overlies this. 15% it will be inferior, and in four cases is superior, which is very relevant for surface projections for the surgical procedures. The transverse sinus varies widely, the proximal part of it, but the lower border of the proximal part of the transverse sinus is actually represented by the insertion of the semispinalis capitis, so that gives you an exact judgment of where to make your incisions. So if we look at the semispinalis capitis muscle, where the jugular bulb is seen, the main relation is the mastoid antrum anteriorly with the air cells and the vertical part of the facial nerve, and medially lies the cerebellum and the superior bulb of the jugular vein. So sometimes in the sigmoid sinus circle, they might be crust, they might be bridges, and they might be plates, and this is because of the flow of blood at the angle. So that is between the upper part and the lower part of the sigmoid sinus where the angulation is present. There might be these bony projections which might cause obstruction to the neurosurgeons. And this uh, triangle, Trutman's triangle is very important both for neurosurgeons and for otolaryngologic surgeons who are doing ear surgery because it's bordered by the superior petrosal sinus. Posteriorly, we have the sigmoid sinus, inferiorly the bulb, bulb of the internal jugular vein, and we have the posterior semicircular canal binding it. And this is a safe area to uh, so do the surgery. So this part, when it is, it can reset. So the classifications are two types on the bones, and 
where they have changed it according to the area of the Trotman's triangle as type 1, type 2, type 3. Uh, air cells are sclerosed, but the sigmoid sinus is usually in a constant position, which can always give you a good bony landmark. And these are the virtual models. Uh, the first model was built in 1980. These are with the micro CT scan data forming these algorithms, which are going to give you more insight in 3D reconstruction depending upon the patient's anatomy which is going to change from patient to patient. And these studies shows number of variables because probably the anatomy uh, studies which are there, they are on dead tissue and the number is also not so much and the authors are different authors doing in different parts of the world. While live patient models will always be more accurate when we decide, decipher the actual venue people will be actually opening up patients for surgery and thank you very much thank you ma'am we have refreshed our knowledge of anatomy and due to time constraints proper t broadcast is not possible we should move towards next session and next chairperson is dr dalji singh sir dr dr satnarayan and dr nitin dage please come up on the speaking for 25 years. Okay. <laughs> You're welcome. Let's change the Sir, board. <laughs> thank you very much. Uh, uh, kind invitation. Thanks for the invitation from Neurovascon and a beautifully organized conference. Uh, <laughs> regarding, I will talk about it 25 years later. So, so this, uh, this is, uh, I, I find Moya Moya disease to be a very humbling disease, I'll be very frank with you. And, and why I said 25 is because that, that was the time of the chief resident and that was the time uh, 99, 1998, and we started seeing these cases. They were referred to me to, to us from neurology. We didn't know what to do with them. I'll be very frank. We, we actually didn't know what. And Dr. Padma used to send them, and she had a lot of interest. And I was with Dr. Mehta, and I used to take them and just collate them because he said you should write a paper. And not knowing that, I'll become a faculty here and I'll continue here. For, and I gave him my own collated data. And this was the 10 years series that uh, we had. There were not too many patients, 44. And uh, we realized that they, they were, they were more, more, surprisingly, that time we had more hemorrhagic, two-third, than ischemic. Revascularization, we were very afraid of what to do, actually. We didn't know. We actually did, started doing uh, the revascularizations only after the Japanese studies started uh, proving them. And we were with, uh, Dr. Suzuki was kind enough to visit us demonstrate a direct anastomosis. That was, I think, early, very early 2000. Um, and then, so if you see the 11 revascularization we performed, nine was indirect, we just did an EDAMS, and only two were uh, direct, and that was a diff big difference. And we realized, if you see, we realized that the, the, the patients we revascularized, direct or indirect, did not have any recurrence of ischemia or hemorrhage, whereas the, the patient we just followed up with neurology in ourselves had around about 37% repeat ischemia and hemorrhage. Then from, from there on we continued and we realized that we have to be more aggressive. We started uh, having these cases referred and then our neurologist said that these patients are becoming better. You please start taking care of them. And that was, we had a wonderful faculty of combined and uh, direct ones, even after vi being visited by Dr. Uh, Suzuki. And post-operative, and we realized that post-operative recurrent ischemic attacks were not there at all in, the pa in these patients which we treated. Um, and the AOS was also improved, and this uh, score which Dr. Joseph designed was uh, had a positive correlation with the Matushima grade. So we realized at that time, direct, the indirect, the pediatric, and the adult, the, even the recurrent open the cilium fissure wide, uh, have an infrasylvian and a supra, have an infrasylvian and a suprasylvian M3, M4. You, we put the frontal branch end to side over the, of the infrasylvian, if you can see the images. And if you see the difference, I used to do in exactly what Dr. Bing used, uh, does, a very small ostomy, fast anastomosis, then I realized it's not worth it. We have to have the, the flow size, the cerebral wall, blood flow is directly proportional to the volume. So we made our ostomy three times the size of the recipient. That is important because we realized that that is very important. It takes a bit more time, then we have a double 
We don't use any heparin. We stop aspirin three days. Initially, I used to be a bit more afraid five days. Then we landed up in one patient having an infarct just after surgery. Then we made it around two to three days. So there's no, no, not too much of oozing. And we start the aspirin the next day after surgery. So if you see this disease, we have so much of learning, and, the, and that's post-op angina. And um, uh, one of our, another residents who is now in the U.S., Hitesh, and Dr. Amol, who's our associate professor, we uh, put this video in Neurology India. You can remarkably improving in all fields. Pediatric inattention and delayed memory and nonverbal intelligence was improving. And this was the psychological assessment batteries. Dr. Rashima Nehra, thanks to her for a wonderful job. She's our uh, professor of neuropsychology. And the, the DSA in this subset of patients in which the, uh, improved uh, on perfusion, the AOS score, and with the Suzuki score, and the brain perfusion also improved on the MR. And this is the present study which is happening, and uh, this is, can we study the intraoperative, either the single or the double barrel? So we, this is an ongoing study, last two years, I've been recruited, and single barrel 11, double barrel 11, we found that there was, there was 53 percent improvement in single barrel and around 171 to 66 in double barrel intraoperative and we and if you do a ct perfusion later it was a single barrel is 12 percent and 36 percent so double barrel give gave more are equal aos score are equal aos scores improve remarkably the outcome after the uh, after, after late suzuki also improved the, the grade six suzuki was not supposed to be improving that also improved the direct i just finish it stop ringing the bell uh, the direct revascularization g requires appropriate lab and simulation skills training, but the direct revascularization with STMCA bypass, STACA is difficult, we, and plus hard, most of the time not required if you're doing a double barrel. Double barrel is better than single barrel because we have proved on intraoperative flow, postoperative cerebral blood volume and uh, postoperative uh, uh, blood, cerebral blood flow. The MR perfusion improves in double barrel more than single barrel and the OS cast grows improved. And now we have seen that even the cognitive domain improve, improves after revascularization. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Any questions? Or no time? <laughs> for what of time, I think so. Any questions? Sometimes patients come to us with the blade retained, and then we do these in the angio control to remove the knife. This patient, the knife uh, caught the carotid artery, so we have to sacrifice that and remove it under angio control. He developed a CSF leak, which we repaired uh, endoscopically. This is a picture of the knife. The patient is clinically fine. This is a patient with a stab to just uh, retained, just medial to the orbit. Uh, you can see it just missed all the vessels, angio is negative, so we remove them under DSA control of glue, and you can sort these patients out with the glue cast in there. Typically, dissections, we see a lot of HIV as well, MCA peripheral, you get right close to the aneurysm, put a drop of glue, and that's sorted. What about sacular aneurysms, colleagues have shown, so I'll stick to a MCA and see how we've evolved our practice over the years. Simple coiling, you can see the double shadow on the left and the lateral view superiorly pointing. Reasonable neck with a simple coil, you can get a good result. Uh, quite a large hematoma, so not all these hematomas need to be evacuated acutely. This patient was clinically well. It's very wide neck aneurysms. It's the MCA with both M2s coming off. We, there are options in the vascular, but these ones are easier to clip, so in our practice, we would take this patient and clip the aneurysm. These type of complex uh, vessels where you need multiple maneuvers to try and Reconstruct endovascularly is better to do a clip reconstruction, and uh, we take these patients for surgery. Similarly, unruptured and inducted with, with a clip. We prefer in these patients who present with a bleed, a uh, uh, young patient with acute subdural with subarach from a PCOM, we take them down to angio, secure the aneurysm first, and then we take them up to theater under the same uh, general anesthetic. We don't heparinize them, just heparin in the flush, and then we do the craniotomy just to remove the hematoma and we find that they tend to do better. Similarly, this patient, uh, older patient with spontaneous bleed, uh, ICH plus subdural in the acute phase. We just did a craniotomy for the ICH. Uh, CTA was negative, but when we look critically at the DSA, we find that there's some anomaly in the distal MCA, which is in keeping with the area of the bleed. So we sec selectively uh, catheterized these, and this looked like a dissection or a mycotic, and we put a drop of glue Worked the patient up, and uh, she had valvular heart disease, so likely it was mycotic. So follow up, you can see uh, after a year, patient uh, recovered well clinically. And our practice changes over time. Looking at some of the old cases we did before, 
Now with more experience, we would treat them endovascularly. This is a patient who came to us in a delayed presentation day five with this uh, acute bleed, but by the time he came to us, there was already infarction. And at angio, we can see severe vasospasm of the A1. So at that time, we elected just to clip this patient. But now if we saw this patient, we, uh, there are methods that we use to, to treat them endovascularly. Tortuous anatomy doesn't always have to be uh, abandoned endovascular. Direct carotid puncture and then also for the vertebral access. This is a patient who turned out to be uh, a partially thrombosed basilar apex, but you can see the severe tortuosity of the arch as well as the vertebral artery. Even if you get a, a, a guide catheter up there, it's very difficult to navigate this tortuosity. But if you look at the subclavian access, so we do distal radial access, it's much easier to come from the subclavian. To access that balloon with this technique, you can do either a sheeping technique with the balloon or you can do an exchange uh, for the balloon. Bring the microcatheter back, put it in the aneurysm. Once you inflate the balloon now, you've got a nice scaffold across the neck of the balloon and then you can do a nice reconstruction with coils um, and, and, and give you a nice result preserving the vessel. This is a young patient who came with this kind of bleed, typical of uh, uh, distal ACA, and you can see the distal ACA aneurysm. There's also a left MCA. So at the time, we said we'll treat the ruptured aneurysm. But we found that the access was difficult and turned out that she had coaptation of the aorta, uh, but we managed to get past, uh, just put a simple coil there, referred her to our vascular colleagues, and then they uh, did the uh, repair of the, the uh, MCA aneurysm. Uh, we said this one is easier to clip, but the, uh, the young patient, previous bleed, needs treatment. But the patient insisted that she wanted endovascular. So we looked at other options. So we, for this patient, we did uh, double balloon remodeling with stenting. You know, so there are options that it, it can be done, and we have to respect the patient's wishes in, in, in these cases. And, and this gives us a nice, uh, durable result. So I think we also should present our complications. Not everything goes as well as we would like. This is a young patient who had this bleed, came to us day four, and it was a M3 segment aneurysm. We thought we'd just partially coil it in the acute setting and come back. Responded well initially, stable, uh, good GCS, so didn't even have an EVD. We were monitoring him clinically, but uh, two weeks while in the ward, sudden drop, and you can see as a result of the hematoma resolving, uh, blocked the foramen of Monroe, developed acute hydrocephalus, took him urgently for EVD craniotomy, but he, he, it was too late, uh, patient demise. So now if we look at that case again, maybe we'd say in retrospect we should have uh, clipped it. But I think also an, another option is to uh, continue surveillance and maybe borehole drainage of the uh, hematoma after, after the coiling. So this is our approach, and uh, this is the crux of it, uh, to look at... Uh, so this clipping versus coiling doesn't become an argument. These uh, treatments become complementary, not opposing. And uh, we are best positioned to make uh, the, the treatment decision for the patient in front of them. So the, the message is that the management has to be individualized based on the healthcare setting that we all work in. ICU beds, theater availability, the follow-up, compliance with dual antiplatelets, the cost of treatment. In our uh, place, if it's suitable for both, we, we go for endovascular as a default. Uh, the patients come directly to us, and I think it should be. The uh, first algorithm is to depend on uh, whether the blade is there or not. If it's removed, then CT angios appear and, and reconstruct. So it's always a deconstructive uh, strategy. So uh, depending on the location of the vessel involved, you have to weigh the, bene uh, the risk of patient developing a deficit. But the problem with these is that if these aneurysms re-bleed, the mortality is extremely high. So you have to balance that risk. So we go for vessel sacrifice regardless of where, where it is. So I think there's no room for reconstruction in, in these type of injuries. So. Good afternoon, the August audience. I'll be presenting the database as well as the basics regarding the clipping of uh, AC aneurysms which are beyond ACOM around one centimeter or so. So the basic planning approach, enigmas and complications for the youngsters who start with the aneurysm surgery. So this is the definition you all know about it and these are the three major classifications. Patient selection you all know, clinical grading, ictals, angiogram and then associated. So this is the next one, A3 and A4 segment aneurysms and beyond. For that the patient position is this one. This is para this one. This is parasagital craniotomy alarms. This is the table position.
so how these are different i'll ju i'll just take up the videos in the end so our database is this one the presentation there are red in frontal lobes and likely to rupture during dissection so standard surgical approaches which have been described in literature are parasitogenital craniotomy bifrontal frontal layer sinuses with the with the later part of my life i have tried to avoid the exposure of the opening of frontal layer sinuses but during the initial days we used to open up because the craniotomy used to be at the skull base exactly so my experience is bifrontal craniotomy and basal interhemispheric approach only rather than the standard unilateral parasitogenital craniotomy for the usual daca so my take surgical technique advantages are meticulous dissection strictly in the midline with minimal retraction distortion of the lobes by type if you are expert enough allows for an external early proximal control of both the a2 so this is some of the examples just see the daca and this is the frontopolar classical daca ct scan when it is completely non specific you just can't make out from the ct scan that it's going to be a daca aneurysm ct scan which no follow up case of azagus a2 and with aneurysm clipped no follow up case of azagus a2 and with aneurysm clipped follow up this was a follow up mri scan now multiple aneurysms this is an example of multiple aneurysms daca acom mca all clipped daca with avm both done simultaneously follow up angiogram so this is an example this is a video i'll just leave it move ahead this is an example of a34 a aneurysm segment a3 and a4 segment aneurysm this is the aneurysm which is too distal now for this it was clipped now this is an archives this patient was clipped somewhere in 14 years 18 years back from 2006 had presented in 2006 with the rupture of daca with this ct scan and this ngo this dsa so it was again clipped so we usually fix this is the outcome according to the clinical grade the outcome 11.5 mortality 4.8 according to the clinical grade 14.2 and 14.2 the net mortality rate 15 charge that is 10% mortality which is a slightly higher which is mentioned in the literature that is around 3 to 6% so impact of ich is not clear mortality is still high in poor grade patients and rebleed in daca is higher with my experience mortality will with improve with same kind of patients and i'll just take you in which the right sided right sided Uh, parasitogenital craniotomy has been placed this is a temporary clip placed placed on a3 segment this is a large aneurysm this is a single region beyond that we do parasitogenital craniotomy we don't do we don't do unilateral for cc and uh, pc uh, aneurysms in the year 2006 we had published this uh, uh, this approach at that time we had 113 aneurysms of the whole department of daca aneurysm in the whole series but after that there were phenomenal increase in the so full full screen color this is classical interhemispheric approach in which the gold standard thing is try to identify the corpus callosum very clearly that is the most important thing identify the corpus callosum identify both the both the both what we were discussing in that is the proximal control is difficult to get in control is difficult to get in the aca segment aneurysms that is the only so in this case just see the proximal proximal control is available it's visible and both the branches are also visible because the craniotomy is slightly on the actually most actually most of the cases in which the hematoma is associated and all those cases are taken up by us only in pj chandigarh the patients first land up with the neurosurgery department and uh, as per the protocol the option is given to the patient but depending upon the economic status and the patient's choice we take up the patient for surgery in in pj even today i think 80 to 90% of the patients are being craniotomies in a2 segment aneurysms proximal control is readily is much better available remove it then bilateral bifrontal approach then you move split the arachnoid you will hit upon the basal cisterns release csf and then you move proximally this is a very good, nice approach for the junior people who are starting and they can tackle the intraoperative rupture much better the more you learn the more the time passes you will be able to uh, fashion your craniotomy much more distally and exactly at the aneurysm because you will become expert in that and you will be good at tracing the aneurysm site 
with the old blood over there. Thank you. So, <clears throat> thank you, Sandeep. May I call upon the next speaker? <laughs> Dr. Nipur. So, this is just a picture, graphical picture of this. And end to side is the, the, one of the most common bypass done by vascular neurosurgeons. And there's no doubt that lab training is very important. What are the challenges? We have a very narrow restricted working space, the sensitivity of the brain to ischemia, the sub-centimeter diameter of these vessels, which further narrow down when we do the arteriotomy. As you see here, you can see the vessel. This is a, this is a lab, uh, this is a rat femoral vein which, on which arteriotomy all already done, but you are hardly able to see the arteriotomy. Even often on a closer inspection, you are not able to see it very well. You can see, if I point it out, then probably you can see this is the site. Lab training is very important, and after getting your expertise, it is that time that you go on to the uh, level of problem solving. We did the study in 45 rats, in which 15 were uh, this uh, flap retraction suture. They immediately we do the second cut like this with our dominant hand. The suture is always helping you and tensing the vessel for, for that cut. We use a curved micro scissor. And now we have come to this. We have a flap in the center with a cut on V-shaped cut on either side. And this we will zoom it. it. Something looks like this. And then we are going to cut only on one side. That is like this. And then we have a flap which previous two cuts <coughs> with a curved micro scissor. And then we have this flap. This flap will be sutured to the do you see, without opening this flap, you hardly see that opening. But when you open up that flap, the MCO opens up for you. Then we take a 11-0 suture next to the neighboring pyre. Use that suture again, 10-0 suture, and use it to get this 11-0 suture in that flap, which as you all know is not going to be part of that anastomosis. And then tie it again to the neighboring pyre and you will see how the MCA opening gets enlarged and much more, you are in a much more better position. You see that how the MCA is opening up now and you are in a much more better position to put your sutures without, and I say without any handling of the MCA vessel. There's hardly any handling of the MCA vessel. Take a little time to get this tension on this suture and you can see how the MCA has opened up now. You have to adjust the tension very carefully. This is a 11-0 suture. Now the suturing starts. And we also please note that we are not using any dye here. We are using a black background and we are not using any dye on the MCA. So you see, without hand handling the MCA, without holding the MCA, the bites are being taken. This is the near side. The near side has been completed and now we go to the flap side. Just to show you how we do the suturing on the flap side and how the flap helps you, you can see that you don't have to handle the MCA at all. You just have to hold that flap gently and get your MCA suture through. That's all. You can pass all the sutures without even cutting that flap. As you see here, this is, the, this is the suture going right at the base of the flap. Now I, I'm going to cut that flap now. A five and then, except for the last suture, you don't tie it strong. Then you take out the superior thyroid, let the blood leak with the air and whatever sediment is there inside. And then you put the last suture. Dr. Sanjay Bihari invited this as a found, as the first video article of Neurology India when it started. And then the external carotid off, and then the common carotid. So the blood and all the bad blood goes into the external and the superior thyroid, then the internal carotid. So the ICA is the first to be on and the last to be off. That is one. So ultimately your clamping time is that. So the, learning this, so no, we, don't, we don't come to the clips, we come to the real life surgery. So this is how you position. I always do under general anesthesia, there's more brain protection. The total surgery doesn't, doesn't take too much of time. Expose, it's all, the glove is a beautiful thing. You just put, you put it under the, the 
uh, for moya moya for this it takes clear of the blood and then the clips in the order which we are saying i don't use slings one number one silk is good enough it it is important because so, suppose your clips clips off you can actually just take the number one and uh, and have a hemostasis and then you can vascular forceps and you're taking off the thing uh, and that is important you must see that where you are you should not leave any flaps of intima there and then the common carotid you just t take them off and you be flush to the lumen this calcium can go, can go right under this bulldog clamp but you're not supposed to chase the calcium and then most important is the common flaps will never give you a, a dissection it is the internal flaps you can we may have to extend this incision you have to be very sure that the that there's no loose flap because the dissection will be there and then stabilize and then suture it as a continuous suture again the same sequence here two uh, uh, two um, things you have to be careful about that your incision has to be right into the middle of the common and the and do not go close to the external otherwise you'll have a stenosis there and then the, let the blood leak for a while after a superior so we have passed the arterial aneurysm now coming directly to the case this is the case of a 65 year old female patient who presented to us with a sudden onset severe holocranial headache and the at presentation the hunterness was grade 2 so this patient had actually two aneurysm one was just uh, distal to the IC bifurcation, um, almost in mean, the proximal A1 and IC junction. And there was a medial directed to of partial artery aneurysm, which can be better appreciated in this uh, CT. So a standard tyrone canotomy and uh, flattening of this canotal ridge was done, up and a uh, zygomatic lowering was done. So after you uh, coagulate the meningo orbital uh, band, we have to dissect off the uh, temporal dura from the cavernous sinus vein. Now this is extremely important step because, and this is a blunt dissection. Now this is important because otherwise the posteriormost part of the anterior clinoid, that is a clinoid tip, won't be properly exposed. And as you can see here, once you do that, you can expose the, uh, the posteriormost part of the uh, anterior clinoid process. Now as we all know that there are three attachments of the anterior clinoid process. The first attachment that has to be removed is from the, uh, the middlemost part of the lesser venous clinoid. So you use the drill and then in the later part we start using the upcut uh, up cut so that the sphenoidal ridge, the, the superior uh, opportunity aneurysm. Now after that uh, we went on to, as you can see here, we will just uh, apply the clip and then coming to the main part of the video, that is the superior artery aneurysm. Now once you, we do that, then we open up the passiform ligament because in any superior superior artery aneurysm, mobilization of the optic nerve is very, very important because you have to retract some amount of optic nerve so that you can actually go to the base of the aneurysm. So once the passiform ligament was opened, then we opened up the, as you can see the passiform ligament is being is being opened. Uh, after you open up the passiform ligament, we gave up the uh, linear incision onto the uh, dura, and this dura incision is extended di right directly to the uh, distal dural ring. As you can see here, this is the part of the distal dural ring. Oh, thank you. Space after you have done the proper chronolectomy, and this is the ophthalmic found out that there was some amount of aneurysm that was still left behind. So here we have uh, applied the clip, and uh, you will see that some amount of the aneurysm was uh, left behind. You can see that some amount of the aneurysm is left behind. So we had to actually reposition our clip so that the aneurysm can be completely occluded. So we reapplied the temporary clip and we repositioned the, we repositioned the uh, clip as you can see here. Now the aneurysm is completely occluded now. Clip was removed and the uh, ICD was done which showed the uh, adequate flow in the IC with non-filling of the aneurysm. Uh, I would also like take this opportunity to invite you all for the upcoming skull based conference which is about a month from now. Thank you. Thank you Dr. Anand. So any questions or comments from audience? Well, so we'll just move on with the next session. So uh, next speaker is Dr. Anil Kumar Sharma. And he's going to talk about surgical excision of giant and large solid hemangioblastomas without preoperative embolization. A very good afternoon to respected chairpersons and all the participants. I'll be speaking on uh, giantly, giant and purely solid hemangioblastomas. Uh, pure solid hemangioblastoma should be treated as AV malformation because the only difference between hemangioblastoma and AV malformation is presence of true capillary network in the hemangioblastoma. That's why these lesions do not present with when major circumferential dissection has been done. 
So this is draining vein is preserved till the end of surgery. Here dissection is being done and lesion is removed and blocked. Patient did well post-operatively and there was no residual in uh, follow-up MRI. <coughs> this is one another giant cerebellar hemangioblastoma. So again the circumferential di dissection is being done, lesion is being tackled all around, feeders are being cut and coagulated and being divided sharply. Dissection is being done all, all around. So these lesions are intensely vascular. If we enter tumor without blush on uh, angiogram, this intraoperative picture and postoperative imaging, there is no residual and lesion removed and block. This surgical video, lesion is being dissected all around. So some uh, <coughs> preoperative emulation may not be always helpful because if there is definite feeder, then only preoperative emulation should be chosen because these tumors may share common supply with normal cortex also. So tumor is being dissected all around and removed and block. So individual tailored approach should be done. Emulation should not be standard of care as reason I mentioned because may share a common supply and <coughs> Presented with a chronic headache of right temporal region, one episode of seizures uh, just before the presentation. As you see here, this is quite a large AVM in the cilium fissure, expanding the fissure, uh, draining with the MC and multiple draining veins, which is draining into the superior sagittal sinus. You can see here the, con the nidus is quite compact, a lot of emphasis vessels. Uh, this is the main feeder, which gives multiple emphasis feeders towards the AVM nidus, and so we decided not to do endovascular after discussing with our endovascular colleagues, and microsurgical excision would be the most appropriate. So this is the position to keep the cilia come all around and never go into the depth at the same time. They have to be sequenced vascular rate. So once you have done with the 90 degrees towards the frontal operculum, now you come to the apex, the superior aspect, and then you go towards the temporal side. As a 360 spiral dissection, you go taking care of all these small, small, small feeders at the same time. The main feeders has to be appropriately taken care without causing any thermal damage and thrombosis in those vessels. So as you see here once, we have done almost now 190 degrees to 120 degrees and uh, you can, you are going at the depth at each quarter so that these small, small vessels, they come from the base and they are from the base of the insula and that's where the main feeders which go down to the depth of the fissure come down. So you zoom out to orient yourself to see what is happening and then you to do the zoom in so that you know uh, circumferentially you are able to take care of these vessels. And you see here, though there is no bleed, she was having multiple hemosiderin deposits all around the nidus. So there was some telltale evidence that she was having some micro bleed and so you can see here quite a lot of micro hemosiderin deposits. This is the temporal side of the AVM as you see here, dissect it out and then you take care of the main vessels and you zoom in and see carefully what are those vessels which sub play the nidus and then you handle them sequentially and make sure that you are, uh, that is, I was quite happy that this is the main feeder so that, that we can devascularize the whole nidus but that was not the case. As you see here there are multiple other small sequential feeders, now that, I thought that all the things are, but still the red veins are there, it is still not devascularized, these are the pink arterialized veins, that means there's some feeder there, still there. So around one artery finally it was at the depth and once we uh, clip that then you can see that the whole vein gets reversed. So you can see that there is one of the artery which was just beneath the draining vein, the confluence of draining veins in fact, and you can see how the nicely the veins, the blue, red veins becoming blue and the whole vasculature, the vascularization happens and you see, so that is the final thing. So now you know that you have deep stop. Thank you very much for this opportunity. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Rupesh. Now I invite Dr. Uh, Pridhat Pati for intracranial AVM surgery. 
this is 35 year female uh, complaining of reeling of head, seizure, vomiting and weakness of left sided body three days history. Uh, she was conscious but aphasic, left hemi, classical hemiplegia is there and CT head you can see there is a dumbbell type of big hematomas. So the moment you see this type of CT one should have a suspicion is it uh, though is hypertensive is it really hypertensive bleed so you further investigation with CT angio and in CT angio you see there is a small AVM of 2 centimeter of size feeding from the M4 segment of MCA and draining vein is to superficial cortical vein. This is after the craniotomy, almost, uh, the hematoma is almost seen in the surface. Video is not running. So, uh, after this, uh, there are parietal as well as posteroparietal hematoma and you have to think from the CT angio where exactly the needles will be. Accordingly, you plan whether to remove the hematoma or not. So, in thinking of uh, putting regular aneurysm clips, but since they are very small, uh, first I coagulated it and when I find the, the real feeder for this aneurysm, uh, I do both the things. I use that uh, small clips we use in general surgery. Uh, that clips, uh, I use it and uh, you see this is the main feeder. I found that this is the main feeder instead of a regular clip whatever, we, there, there is a constraint on getting those clips in our setup mm -hmm. uh, in the view of the group of patients because the government rule is there are some concession to the patients, they are free patients so we cannot afford the costly clips so we use this small to uh, the excision and uh, tying the venous feeder. So once you are assured of that you are cleared of all the feeders, then you go for the last stage, I think there is some, I, I usually prefer the, in this particular case I, I took that uh, one silk and tied the vein and uh, once this tie and this is very small uh, thin here, the, the moment I tied I wanted to put two ties up and down and then cut it. But unfortunately, that broke. And so I put another clip over that venous uh, denis and then coagulated it. Once I coagulated it, this completion of the surgery, and uh, this is the patient, this is the post op scan, this is the biopsy material. So I asked a wise man which carrier I should choose. He smiled a little and replied, be a good human being. There are lots of opportunities. Space in this crowded area, this neurovascular mobilization will allow us an extensive drilling. And secondly, there is always a chance of accidental injury. Moreover, you can always, you know, spill the bone dust all over and cause uh, sometimes meningitis like reaction. But nevertheless, it has been uh, the work ho horse for us uh, for a long time. But nevertheless, it has been uh, the work ho horse for us uh, for a long time and it leads to very good aneurysm closure. On the other hand, off late we have almost completely uh, gone into external clinodectomy where there is peeling of the cavernous sinus lateral wall because it is necessary to expose the clinoid completely because the clinoid is hidden there. And the, the three attachments of the clinoid, as I'll show in the next slide, are drilled sequentially and the headache. As you see, there was thick clot around the cilium fissure, more on the right side. We suck out the blood and we retrogradely trace the ICA bifurcation till we come to the area of the aneurysm. As you see, the aneurysm has been covered with clot here and there is practically no space at all. Now we conduct the remaining part of the clinodectomy intradurally. The dura is exposed there 
and we have already done two thirds of the drilling outside. So this crater that we created will help us in conducting the interdrill part more easily in a, in a very short span of time. As you see, the clinoid is exposed completely. And all you have to do is you have to drill the optic strut that was remaining behind. And as you dissect in this area, you see that the clinoid starts moving. Then you know that the disconnection is complete. The clinoid is removed in such a way that the pressure is away from the hole. You have decompressed the optic nerve. All you have to do now is occlude the aneurysm and verify that the occlusion is complete. We can see that the patency of the blood vessel as well as the optic nerve is preserved. It is paramount to see the vasculature of the optic nerve as well. The patient made an uneventful recovery. There was slight third nerve paresis, which eventually improved. So uh, with this, I would say that hybrid clinoidectomy is a technique which may not be required in all cases, but of course it provides you a third option. Thank you, and I take this opportunity to invite you all to Lucknow for this Kalbiscon. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Dr. Anand. So, with this, thank you, sir. With this, I conclude this session because the Dr. Paratosh Pandey is not here. Uh, there is slight change. Uh, we are uh, starting with the general ethics uh, session. And for that, I invite Dr. Pradipta Tripathi and Dr. Rajneesh Kachra for, to chair the session. So, uh, first of all, apologies for modifying the session because uh, the co-speaker, Dr. Girish Tyagi, whom uh, everybody knows in this city, uh, he has well as issues related to med medical negligence. And Dr. Tyagi is here with me. So, we interchange uh, the talks. And why such talks are important uh, in the conferences uh, like these are that in order to get accreditation for uh, registrations for the source, also talked about uh, prescribing only uh, generic medicines. And in addition, there are is several other issues on which we have had some uh, concern. So, the normal process is that if there is any change in the regulation, the gadget notification has a pre-gadget stage which uh, is published for the public to give their opinion. And uh, while giving uh, that, uh, we there was opinion for seek from the general public, that's all stakeholder, to go through those papers and give your opinion before it is final published for uh, uh, as an authority f subsequently. So when this NMC guideline was uh, circulated, Delhi took a decision to in medicine regarding the various aspect of it. So we sat on this. We tried to understand various aspects of that NMC Act. We suggested the modification ethics regulation 2002. That means whatever is written in 2002, we are bound to be following that. And 2023, which has been put in abeyance, is actually likely to come back soon. It is thus not it has been deferred for uh, infinity. No, it is going to come back with some modifications and all. So before we go to that, let us try, let us try to understand as on today, Dr. Tyagi will be talking only on that aspect. So let me briefly take you to their journey. Now this is called code of medical ethics it has two parts one i don't one i don't recall i ever did it i don't know how many of you have actually done it but that's the first statement which had come in regulation 2002 and this is that declarations which essentially is something similar to hippocratic oath which one has to sign and put it so that was the first line of this now there are eight chapters on this regulation <clears throat> We have something here. Physicians should try continuously to improve their medical knowledge. Working. Do we have a better, something different? Okay. Now, it also says we should display our registration number. None of us in medical, uh, at least in hospital and all, is displaying our medical registration number, although I have seen many private practitioners in their prescription, it is medical registration number is written. 
certificate, diploma, membership, honors, which confirm professional knowledge and recognizes the qualification and achievement. So meaning thereby, if you are writing some kind of degree, diploma, member of medical fraternity, we should know what all is written, whether we agree or we do not agree, or we want some kind of a modifications to be done, I think we must first understand. We should observe various laws of the country's number of acts by which a medical profession is governed and we should all be governing it. Duties of the physician to the patient. Now, huge list, no time to discuss. Patient delicacy and secrecy, we all know about. Should never reveal the disease unless it is required by the law in cases of an epidemic, an endemic. No disease is to be disclosed to anything. Prognosis should never be exaggerated or minimized. Okay, ops cases, duty of physician in consultation. Now that's very important for us. Le read it and try to understand. It says, physician should call for any kind of an opinion. Now, treatment after the consultation. If suppose as an expert you have gone and advised some uh, treatment to a particular case, is it obligatory for a person to abide by that uh, consultation? It's a matter of debate. What it says, it is no decision should restrain the attending physician from making such subsequent variation in the treatment, if any, unexpected changes occur. But at the next consultation, reason for variation should be discussed. Meaning, if you are changing your treatment, based ability toward the pharmacist and the nurses, it says we must engage ourselves for the education of the nurses as well. Now, what is unethical? Advertising, now that's a very important thing which is coming up. Now, advertising, it says, soliciting patient directly or indirectly by the physician, by a group of physician or by the institution or by the organization is unethical. Now believe me, even I had not read in micro detailing before this, when we, very often we find one page, half page advertisement, even if coming by the institutions, uh, photographs of a group of new consultants have joined, shifted an address and all, I mean partially that is also unethical. Now although they have given when you can advertise that those regulations are unethical, there are different tires of uh, penalties, different uh, tires of uh, misconduct and uh, different uh, tires of engagement of the doctors which been closely gripped uh, to do certain things of uh, restricted uh, approach in uh, dealing the patients. So I think because of the constraint of the time, I'll pause it here and I would request Dr. Tyagi to take over for uh, the rest of the presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Jaldeep, and uh, thank you, Dr. Chairperson, sir. Yeah, by uh, Dr. Girish Tyagi, yeah, please. Thank you, organizers. Because the, these regulations, there were only t two or three contentious issues, otherwise they will pass. Because the, these regulations, there were only t two or three contentious issues, otherwise they will pass, of course, automatically within one month or few months, they will automatically come. But there are two contentious issues. One was the generic drug, and another was the CME part. And uh, CME part, we as a doctor were asking that uh, about the generic drug that uh, let the quality of the generic drug be, uh, be the, uh, improved or the let the brand as it is. Then those, these kind of conferences uh, or seminar or workshop will automatically be cancelled because ultimately the role of the pharma is there with, uh, with CME. Apart from the medical language, there is a professional misconduct part and now they have attached that level of punishment. That means the, that the state medical council will be forced to take action against the doctor if there is any professional misconduct since it is being a law now. So I will be talking just about those uh, parts. So professional misconduct, the level of punishment has been advised. There are th five levels of punishment. Level one is the reformation, that is the advisory part, advisory instruction or warning, up to three months. Level three, suspension of license up to three months. Le level four is punishment ranging from three months to three years. Level five is permanently neighborhood. So level two, three, four, whether uh, name removed for the 30 days or three years, that means that during those days, if that action has been taken, you cannot practice medicine. So that is very, very important. 
Well, first going with the level four punishment, which is about that three months to three years. Sexual boundary violation. Then of course, if the doctor is involved with any sexual boundary violation with the patient, uh, we, when we go through the any complaint, there are in the numerous cases, there are con consent is not proper. Either the sometimes the patient signature is not there, sometimes the doctor signature is not there, sometimes the procedure is not mentioned, sometimes that uh, mm, no witness is there. So consent has to be proper. And in some cases, the consent has taken, there is a blanket, there is a printed consent in English, then the patient putting a thumb impression. So automatically, if the patient is illiterate and you're, and he's uh, asking to uh, put a thumb impression on an English language or printed, it automatically will not be considered, it will be treated as a not a proper consent. So we have to be very careful wh what we can do. If, if it is a patient is a literate or s at least section 21, RMP should take, it's a very broad language. RMP should take due care in practice and exercise reasonable skills as expected. So the, it is of course not uh, in a bilkul black and white, but of course uh, we have to give the due care and exercise our reasonable skills as expected. And if the patient or the letters are able to prove that the reasonable ex ex skill is not utilized by that particular doctor and due care is not being given, then of course name can be removed for three years. And of course it is a gray area to be there. Incapacity, a registered medical practitioner having inca any, any incapacity induced or the detriment for three years, for three years directly. Then the section 26 of RMP is free to choose whom we will serve except in the case of life-threatening emergency. Uh, in the life-threatening emergency, you have to Stabilize the case and of course uh, according to your capability and uh, available circumstances, then it has to be documented. If the patient is a emergency, then you have to, uh, after stabilizing, you have to refer the patient, but you have to document that, uh, that in your records. Change of RMP about that consent should be there. In case of, uh, th this is a, uh, one thing which the uh, NMC regulation, uh, 2022, which of course the note was there in the IMC regulation. In case of abusive, unruly, and violent patient or relative, the RMP can document and report the behavior and refuse to treat the patient. So uh, if the patient or the relatives are not uh, following your guideline, they are abusive, or you can directly uh, refer to them at another place, but documentation is required. So such patient should be required, referred and for the treatment. But if it is, if it is not properly documenting, if, if, even if the patient is uh, violent or uh, abusive or unruly or other uh, social platforms on which we are, we, we are receiving number of complaints previously also from the, at Delhi Medical Council against that uh, when the patient is asking that they have gone to that social platform and from that they, because of that they have gone to that doctor and now there is this, this complication or that occurred. Here also the punishment is up to that. Your name can be removed for three months. Section 10A about that endor endorsement part. RMP individually or a part of an organization, association, society shall not give any approval. That means uh, for uh, an, any association or organization or society, we shall not endorse any or approval or recommendation to that particular product work. So the punishment is up to uh, uh, for three months. Section 12C, RMP, RMP shall not administer or dispense or prescribe secret medial, remedial agents of which he does not know the kind. This is an important thing. I don't know whether these our neurosurgical friends are using some these Himalaya or ML type of products because it clearly says that you cannot prescribe or dispense secret remedial agents of which you, do, you, you does not know the composition because we uh, as doctors are using that uh, leaf 52 or cystone or etc type of aerodic or uh, medicines which uh, we don't count no composition so we have to be very particular that we should not prescribe these kind of medicines because action should not be issued. Section 8, 18 says that uh, you can, RMP shall not refuse on religious ground alone on the product of, on the conduct of sterility, birth control, etc. Here also the punishment up to three years, uh, up to three months. Section 20 C, 20C say, in case of emergency, first aid and other services according to expertise and available resources. If, uh, that has to be documented because if it is not properly documented, name can be removed for three months also. Section 24 is very, very important about the confidential part, which the Dr. Daljit told about uh, here also the punishment is up to three months. Every communication between RMP and patient shall be kept confidential unless required by the laws of, of the state or the detriment to the patient other. Because you must be dealing with that uh, serious patient in the ICU or because every other day the other friend or relative will be coming to asking for the patient uh, 
uh, how is improving or deteriorating and you are providing information to those patients. So in the times to come, these kind of complaints will be increased because the might the patient will allege that you have provided information to his uh, X, X, y, X, Y, Z friend or another friend because uh, so be particular to provide before providing information. See, you have to see to that you, to whom you are providing the information because Section 26 says that RMP, they, you can free to choose whom will serve, except in case of life threatening emergency, of course, you have to document shops, symposia, conference, etc., which involves, that is very important, because of that, they, these are kept in abeyance for that matter. Then level two punishment is up to three, uh, 30 days. The, these are, punishment is up to 30 days, but the, these, these, uh, these uh, misconducts are, we are dealing with daily practically. Section 11 says soliciting of patients in the, in, in the name of publication, because we are putting our videos in the social media or so like for the public education because public education and soliciting a patient is a, is a very thin line. So we have to be very careful when uh, the, about that public education or soliciting a patient in the name of public education. Open medical, medical shop, it is for that matter. Se section 13 A, B, C, D, that is very, very important. A, B, C, D, medical records, that you have section 13 A, B, C, D, that is very, very important. A, B, C, D, medical records, that you have to maintain within three so before referral, when you are referring the patient, you have to mention the investigation and you have to justify the referral. Because if you are uh, referring the patient, if the RMP is referring the patient to a neurologist or cardiologist or etc., you have to provide justification that discharge summary itself. If it is not justified, then even then the action can be initiated for that. Section 28 is signature, which applies to all of us because we as doctors, maybe the private sector are putting those, uh, their signature, name and thumb impression, but at the government sector, we, we, are, we, we know all the kind of things, but th the action can be taken against even the government sector or private sector if we are not putting our signature, num the action can be taken against even the government sector or private sector if we are not putting our signature, num name or stamp. Then of course, telemedicine uh, consultation, we provide the telemedicine guidelines. then the professional integrity, the, these are all. So we have to be very careful. At uh, Delhi Medical Council, we receive down to 45 to 50 complaints per month. That means one to two complaints per day we are receiving. And of course, uh, now the complaints against, might be they will not file a complaint against, the, against for, the doctor, uh, for the medical uh, uh, language. In those situations, what uh, patient will tell, you are explaining everything about the disease, but he is not able to, and he says, Whatever you feel good, you do it. And later on, he changes his version. Then, I mean, what is the, uh, anything? Yes, Dr. Sahib, uh, because uh, they, they initially when they will come, they, of course, they will uh, give, give it to 100% freedom to do whatever you do. We have to be very careful about that. Uh, one, the two things which that's why they're so, so in that's why they're family. So, so in this situation, shall we uh, ask to write in Hindi and whatever language they understand, we write in Hindi all the whatever you explained. Yeah, no, no, you can write in English, but, but if the patient is not illiterate, so at least in the this file, some lines can be, be written written. by the patient in Hindi. Okay. Sir, consent me informed consent is that ki usko procedure bata diya gaya, usko complication bata diya, alternative bata diya, benefit bata diya. So, the, uh, at least some lines can be written by those patient or relatives that they have been told. Uh, recently, uh, 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 we have taken a Sumoto case and we have asked audience for uh, audience for uh, India. Please note down something very, very carefully. There are two aspects. One is medical negligence, which means you did something which you were not supposed to do and you could not do something which you are supposed to do. That was what is the definition of a medical negligence is in treating a patient. All we talked are from teaching institutions are involved. You know, earlier it was that the medical professors were exempted for any kind of uh, certification of five years credit hours. Now, even for us, we are at par with general RMP, 30 hours for every five years. So we wrote down why, why are we are at par? Now, suppose you attend a meeting as a delegate, you are given one credit hour for uh, attending a meeting of say one day. Anybody who has come prepared. And Dr. Nupur Prati to kindly come on the days and chair the session.
पैर पे जाना पड़ता है So I request uh, Dr. Shiv Shankar to present on surgical treatment of aneurysms of basilar artery. His personal, personal to achieve optimal surgical results, we need to master the art of exposing them, rather convexitizing them by a properly chosen approach and combination of excellent technical skills to define the neck and fundus and clip the neck in narrow corridors. That is the key. Subretinal dissection is the foundation of vascular neurosurgery. It houses all the neurovascular structures during the dissection of uh, the fundus and the neck. So for that reason, in case of need, we should be doing it. And we should have uh, awareness about what is going with the uh, uh, endovascular treatment also. There are different approaches have been described and they have been well discussed in last day and today also. So factors which decide the approach are mainly the neck height related to the dorsum cellae, perforators anatomy, aneurysm anatomy, direction and projection of the fundus and its relationship to the surrounding neurovascular structures, size and length of PCOM and ICA. Okay. The approach is what we commonly do and I do is a transylvian and subtemporal and transcavernal neck was well defined. So this is the normal position white give and this is a keyboard hole. Then go ahead with the FTOZ and take out the clinoid uh, and uh, then open the dura and this is uh, the clinoid being taken out because uh, removing the clinoid and sometimes strut gives a more space here. This is anatomy what we're seeing here that is optic now and once completely of uh, having a persistent primitive trigonal artery. So wherein this persist, uh, trigonal artery persists in the uh, and uh, in this case uh, we need to study the vascular anatomy properly. This is the aneurysm here multilobulated uh, superior projecting anterior projecting and this is a primitive trigonal artery which is supplying the whole of the left side. Left side IC was not there, left side was completely supplied by this. And somewhere this is the PCA, fetal PCA on the uh, right side from which we approached. Yeah. So uh, studying the vascular anatomy is what, this is what we can see here, the large multi aneurysm anterior projection. This is a position what we routinely give and do a FTOZ craniotomy, then do a clinoidectomy. And I took out the strut because you can see here that this side, the PCOM was very large. It's appearing as if it is a, a ICA bifurcation. So for mobilizing the ICA, uh, to go to the narrow corridor into the depth, uh, I took out even the strut here. That is, yeah, that is a strut being taken out in the last step here. The video the quality is not good here. So this is a next interesting case of uh, superior cerebratory aneurysm. Uh, you can see the anatomy. The fund and uh, PCA is above the fundus of the aneurysm here. This is the PCA on this side is going across it. And uh, we need to plan the, uh, this thing well above the clinoid. And this is the routine position and uh, opening as you saw. This is FTOZ canotomy and clinoidectomy. And uh, for this, uh, yeah, sylvian dissection, you can see the fresh uh, hematoma here, this SAH. And uh, these veins were obstructing. I took out the frontal veins here. So this is the bifurcation, A1, M1, and 3 and I further dissect the, the, the posterior fundus, that is the intricordial artery. It further narrowed my space here, but uh, I could manage it. This is the posterior perforators. The fundus is being lifted. It is quite lax. And uh, so because of this, uh, rupture will not happen. And uh, I can go ahead with the simple clipping here once it is completely exposed. In, if required, you can coagulate the fundus and reshape it. That is the third now. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Tumor. Now, character body tumor is uh, uh, for a character body, as we all know, lies at the character bifurcation. And basically, it is a chemoreceptor organ and it controls the autonomous control of blood pressure, heart rate, and the respiration. It is stimulated by any condition which causes hypoxia, acidosis, or hypercarbia. Now, uh, these character body tumors are, uh, are uh, tumors which are a group of uh, paraganglionomas. Uh, paraganglionomas are tumors which arise from the embryonic neural crest in the parasympathetic system of the head and neck region. Character body is by far the most common location, accounting for nearly 50 to 60 percent of all these tumors, followed by middle ear and PDs. Now, these are slow growing tumors, and their patients are asymptomatic for a pretty long time. They usually present with neck swelling in the entire triangle of neck. Sometimes, when the swelling is large, then they can present with cranial nerve deficit. Majority of these tumors are benign tumors. However, 15% of them, they tend to metastasize. Investigation of choice is uh, CT along with the MRI angiography. Catecholamine workup is really needed because these are non-secreting tumors. 
the most commonly used uh, classification is the shambling's classification this can be embolized however this is controversial and nutrient therapy is family restricted for it you have to first open up the carotid sheet and you have to first identify the internal jugular vein this is the internal jugular vein out here the internal jugular vein has to be separated from the surrounding parenchyma and once that is done the internal jugular vein has to be li ligated and sacrificed now this is important because otherwise you won't be able to go around the tumor and the tributaries of the uh, internal jugular vein like the common fishing vein also has to be sacrificed once you do that you have to go on to the common carotid artery the carotid sheet has already been open so you are uh, this is the loose areolar tissue that is present over the carotid uh, artery that has to be sacrificed and that has been removed from the eca and the eca is been sacrificed and this is necessary because so here we are first we were at the external carotid artery and now from the internal carotid artery side we are trying to to remove the part of the tumor which is adherent to the carotid bifurcation we are seeing some amount of the tumor is being left behind at the common carotid artery these are anyways benign tumors they rarely grow uh, again so here we are removing this part of the tumor the last part of the tumor which is adhered to the common carotid uh, sorry to the carotid bifurcation one has to be very careful here uh, once that is done once you take out the last part of the tumor this is the last part of the tumor that has been adhered to the uh, bi carotid bifurcation see the residual part of the tumor is out here one has to be very careful and otherwise it can be massive bleeding and can lead to catastrophe once you do that you take control of the proximal part of the ica because now the only part that is adhered that is adhered to the ica is the distal part of the ica and to the hypoglossal nerve superiorly so here what we are doing is we are separating the ica from the uh, from the tumor capsule once you do that then you move on to the hypoglossal nerve this is the hypoglossal nerve here this is densely adhered to the tumor but on careful dissection you can take off the uh, hypoglossal nerve from an image you can see the eca the common carotid artery the ica and the vagus nerve and the spinal accessory nerve so the take home message is these are benign tumors and they present with neck swelling ct and the mri with angiography are the usual investigations of choice they are usually non secreting and they won't require any uh, catecholamine workup until unless there is uh, multiple lesions are present or the patient has symptoms of uh, hemodynamic instability especially hypertension surgical excision is the mainstay of treatment uh, i once again uh, remind you of the upcoming conference at our institute on about uh, one month from now thank you so much thank you anand uh, we invite uh, next speaker dr raj it might look simple so but generally speaking most important thing is the stenosis which is proximal to the aneurysm is proximal to the aneurysm second is a vertebro basilar junction fusiform aneurysm third is a, a basilar top aneurysm which is incorporating uh, both the superior cerebellar arteries and the posterior cerebellar arteries uh, this patient a giant aneurysm who had an incidental co coarctation of aorta uh, here aneurysm which uh, two daughter sacs one superiorly pointing and one medially pointing uh, another aneurysm which is partially above the uh, intracranial and partially within the dural cave and uh, for this aneurysm the classical teaching is to perform a balloon occlusion test with simple pushable coils which are peripheral coils which are used here and uh, after the uh, the aneurysm is not filling any more and uh, this is a second uh, illustration of a 55 year old hypertensive left retroorbital pain and ptosis uh, again a giant aneurysm involving the cavernous ica and um, here again there are no collaterals on simple injection whereas uh, with the balloon occlusion test we found that there were good collaterals and as you note here this was performed on electrophysiological monitoring with hypotensive challenge challenge these are the uh, electrodes to 30 minutes show uh, do not show any uh, neurological deficits however we still tell the patient that despite all these measures there is a 10% risk of neurological deficits uh, following this uh, procedure uh, then a 46 year old female severe neck pain and headache uh, there is a probably a dissecting aneurysm involving the vertebro basilar junction the interesting thing to note here is that uh, there is filling of this aneurysm from the anterior circulation as well uh, the one which is pointing laterally uh, this was an incidental aneurysm um, both options were discussed with the patient and uh, along with the flow diverter because a pure flow diverter may not sometimes uh, uh, facilitate healing in this process so partial coiling and then flow diverter placement uh, follow up after 3 months shows that the aneurysm is excluded from the circulation and the angioplasty site shows no reocclusion hence it was not stented and this patient's ptosis improved uh, from sac itself uh, patient expired on post op date and because of pulmonary complications so rajesh you should conclude now yeah uh, so this patient again diagnosed as meningioma but it's important that we uh, 
make sure that we rule out uh, aneurysms in such patients. And uh, this patient also underwent an uh, endovascular technique. And this is a vertebral basilar aneurysm where telescopic uh, braided stents were placed. So uh, the take home message is that there are a variety of endovascular options complex intracranial aneurysms. Cost is the main limiting factor. However, a thorough study of the aneurysm, uh, of the angiogram, right from the aortic arch, and including balloon occlusion test, especially in cavernous venous aneurysms, can uh, uh, help plan appropriate treatment. Thank you. Periodic patients have different etiology of a spontaneous cerebral hemorrhage. And in children less than one year, the region of bleed is different than the other age group. In children between 1 to 18 years old, Arterial venous malformation is the cause in 50 to 70 percent and cavernoma in 10 to 15 percent and arrhythmia in 10 percent. And others are bleeding disorders and cardiac causes that are well established reasons. Complete obliteration may cause bleed due to hemodynamic changes in these patients. Incomplete obliterations are more vulnerable due to associated extra anomaly, due to concurrent endism, venous ectasia, venous stenosis, etc. And there is little literature exists regarding embolization with curative intent in periodic spontaneous hemorrhage and role of adjuvant embolization, although advocated in such cases. But uh, they have inherent potential of rebreed that put question marks over uh, utility in such patients. The patient profile that uh, I have treated in uh, last four to five years is around 80 patients. And 40% uh, was uh, having artificial malformation, 10% was in the. This is the video following the blue embolization. There was complete obliteration of the AVM, and it was feeding, uh, draining through the, the vein was patent, superficial vein was patent, that was draining the sagittal sinus. You can see here the glue cast on the follow-up, and the superficial vein that was draining the sagittal sinus. There was no further bleed in this patient, and hematoma has resolved. This is a follow-up MRI angiography that was done at least one year later. There is another case of 16-year-old male uh, uh, having uh, history of seizures and uh, six months uh, back, uh, six days back history of ictus. And uh, on uh, evidence of uh, hematoma, uh, MRI was of vomiting six, three days back. Uh, CT scan revealed a large hematoma in the uh, right parietal lesion. And on DSA, the patient was having uh, uh, AVM in the region of the ear. To illustrate another case of 10 year old female patient uh, who was having uh, the complaint of five days back of the ictus. And uh, you can notice here the choroidal AVM it was embolized, and uh, there was complete obliteration of the AVM. This is a super selective catheterization and uh, embolization of the AVM. There is another case uh, was having intraventricular bleed with uh, component of intraperitoneal hemorrhage. The AVM was there in the distal uh, choroidal segment uh, on the right side, and uh, on the uh, DSA you can see it here. There was AVM which was draining into the deep venous system. What I want to uh, show you in this image, there was a blue cast in the region of the intraventricular region, and uh, it was going into the intraventricular region and uh, uh, basal ganglia region. You can see it here on the follow-up of CT scan. The blue cast that is here in the intraventricular region and the basal ganglia region, there was no evidence of hematoma on the follow-up. So another case, there was a 12-year-old female patient who was having a large hematoma in the periphery location. And on uh, DSA, there was a dissecting aneurysm. Uh, you can see it here. And the uh, patient was uh, planned for uh, uh, coil obliteration of the aneurysm because it was distally located. And uh, we had gone with the procedure. And uh, as the uh, for diverting the stent acidic coiling was not an option, we had gone for the complete uh, obliteration of the aneurysm. And finally, there was, it was having uh, almost uh, initial uh, CT scan. Later on, it was. There, no evidence of bleed and there was no uh, residual AVM. In your architecturally, these patients were having the similar features both in the embolization group and the surgical group, either in the size of the AVM, <laughs> and the basic difference was the rebleed in the incomplete obliteration of the aneurysm. And uh, in the surgical group, there was two motility, but there was no basic difference between while I had used the glue or onyx. And finally, there are some messages. Uh, uh, to take home message from this is spontaneous hemorrhage in periodic age groups should be properly specifically DSA. AVM treated by embolization with creative intent may have similar yield to surgery in carefully selected patients in early phase, and earlier intervention may give better neurological recovery. In complete embolization, increase the risk of hemorrhage, suggesting the importance of complete obliteration of AVM in such lesions in periodic patients. Uh, 
Uh, glue can be used with equal efficacy similar to other liquid embolizing agent agonics to achieve complete obliteration of the FGM in such scenario. All the recollection was not seen on follow-up uh, as suggested by no evidence of residual FGM on early follow-up, but there are chances of recollection in uh, these cases on long follow-up. In reasonable bleed, if ready patients have comparable results to macro surgery, and we perform surgical exogenic. For all of us, being a very unique problem. For all of us, being a very unique problem. So blood blister aneurysms, as you can see here, uh, I've mentioned they are having a unique class of presentation, morphology, and ways of diagnosis and management. Of late, when we are realized that with the advent of new technology in diagnosis and having good imaging uh, quality, we have been realizing and recognizing this entity more frequently. So having said so, Blood blister aneurysms represent a unique class of aneurysms. They are small at the part of a sector rupture by only fragments or of adventitia and situation to control the bleeding and then secure the uh, aneurysm and uh, plug the hole. So histo histologically the, it has been studied that these aneurysms have absence of internal elastic lamina, absence of smooth vessels as well as there is a wall defect covered with a blood clot or a fibrinous uh, tissue. The vessel wall does not involve all the layers of the wall. So with new studies about it, we can miss some aneurysms which are largest, but uh, which, we, which can be uh, associated like in this case where it was not picked up on the CT angio, but this is the blister aneurysm or a small aneurysm which has been picked up on the rotational angio. So having said so, we have to have a follow-up if there is a negative DSA uh, and do a repeat or a interval DSA uh, usually when we suspect a subarachnoid hemorrhage and the negative DSA at the initial. So we may place it at high, high risk of aneurysm rupture during therapeutic strategies. Surgery, various these are ruptured ones, but the antiplatelets may be an issue. So we have to very be we have to be very careful while using this and planning the strategies. But what I have realized, antiplatelet in a ruptured aneurysm, I feel subarachnoid hemorrhage is a pro-coagulation uh, uh, state, and usually these uh, aneurysms don't rupture if we plan the antiplatelet just prior to uh, planning the treatment, as we uh, strategize. On the, on the table, we load these patients. So <clears throat> the philosophy definitely is to treat this aneurysm with uh, flow diverters. And what is the concept is just for uh, most of us have already been discussed about, lots have been talked about flow diverters, but I feel this is very important to understand. It's a stent which is placed along the neck of the aneurysm, anti, uh, uh, distally and proximally covering the neck. Also, we don't have to bother about the parent, uh, perforators, but the most important thing is wall opposition as well as the sizing of the flow diverter stand. That's the key, and with experience, we have less and less complication and better outcomes. So this is the principal philosophy, what happens with a control and a stent, plain stent with a flow diverter. This is a pipeline uh, device which has been studies has shown that there is a diversion of the flow, newer intima, uh, newer intima formation along the uh, flow diverter and uh, there is a restriction of flow and the aneurysm and this was the aneurysm which was covered at the superior hypopartial. This was the one month follow up and this is the follow four months later, you can see there's and when it, uh, when it is used uh, very wisely, properly, adequately in select patient, it may be a good boon uh, for the management of this patient. Thank you so much. Thank you, Nitin. The last speaker of the session, Anil, uh, he's talking about surgical strategies for giant and large aneurysms. A very good afternoon. I'll speak on um, surgical management of uh, giant and large aneurysm. So as we all know, despite all the, all the advancement in the endovascular and microsurgical technique, surgical treatment or endovascular treatment of these giant aneurysm remains difficult and challenging to treat. These giant aneurysm constitute almost 3 to 5% of the cases 
this uh, joint partially thrombosed aneurysm. Ciliar fissure has been opened to uh, take uh, uh, proximal control. Here, an aneurysm partially thrombosed part comes into view, and this uh, is being decompressed with ultrasonic aspirator as it's difficult to identify the proximal and distal part. So this has, is being decompressed with ultrasonic aspirator. This has been clipped and to augment the flow, STMC bypass was done. One important thing that I would like to tell in these kind of, particularly these kind of giant aneurysm, it is advisable not to remove the capsule completely because a lot of purpose is post-operative injury. This one, another case, uh, giant aneurysm at Batibo Vesilar Junction aneurysm. Patient was bed bound preoperatively. He presented with, <coughs> he was not able to walk and uh, uh, various cranial neuro neurological deficits. So here we can see ICA uh, can be seen in, on this side and aneurysm is proximal to ICA and beyond Batibo Vesilar Junction. This is the MR picture of the aneurysm. We can see how uh, brain stem is severely compressed, partially thrombosed. We can see here. So in this case, if we, this is, this is the surgical video. This uh, patient underwent far lateral approach. So in giant aneurysm, this sharp dissection is being done of the neck. Here we can see uh, ICA of this side. And now aneurysm is being decompressed with ultrasonic aspirator and uh, temporary clip applied and clip placed. This is another case of uh, bilateral MCA uh, bifurcation aneurysm. She presented with uh, subarachnoid hemorrhage dissected and being defined. This aneurysm neck has been defined and is being present did well postoperatively. So conclusion is surgical treatment of these kind of aneurysm should be determined on individual basis based on variety of factors including morphology, location, size, patient preference and clinical status. And uh, it's advisable not to remove the capsule unnecessarily because surrounding arteries and perforators are often adherent to the surface of the capsule. It's advisable to leave some part of the capsule and uh, uh, after decompression. And we can incorporate revascularization strategies into the surgical uh, may contribute to achieve favorable outcome. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Anil. Uh, now this session is open for a couple of questions or comments. Uh, Anil, uh, a very nice presentation. Thank you, sir. Uh, very large aneurysm. And many of them are almost total thrombos or partial thrombos. My point is that uh, how we'll decide which patient will need a low flow bypass and a high flow bypass. No, th what that will be the criteria for your selection? Th that's decided on variety of factors, sir. Like in this case, in uh, uh, this uh, giant MC aneurysm. So this was to just the augment the flow. There are two kind of bypass, but this one was to just augment the flow. Because flow was not proper in the distal part, so it was just to augment the flow. That's yeah. So while interventions, as you are talking, in any of this, because once you secure the aneurysm properly, scientifically, so that the concept of the deploying a flow diverter, wall opposition, there should be a stasis after you open up the stent into the aneurysm, which is a mandatory to see. Otherwise, there may be a, a flow into the aneurysm right from the side of the flow diverter, then you have not done a good job and there will be re-bleed. So this is a very important concept that uh, the outcome of these flow diverters have been improving over and over and now we have a 95% success rate in this complex aneurysm, especially those giant ones and plus distal aneurysm. Otherwise, we don't have an option which earlier we used to do, put a slave the surface is not irregular. So, as always stress, understanding the uh, anatomy, the configuration of the aneurysm, if there are bilateral, the one which has bled has to be treated first and of course subsequently the other one needs to be treated because patient is on antiplatelet. Sir, one more You are question. still continuing with clopidogrel or yeah. ticagrel? So we will continue the antiplatelet double for six months and single antiplatelet for one year. 
We are still giving clopidogrel, not switch so to the ticagrel. We, uh, we have shifted to ticagrel now with the uh, uh, incidence, more incidence of uh, resistance to clopidogrel. Yeah. Sir, in case of ruptured blisters, do you put a coil and uh, FD or you just put FD? No, no, we cannot put a coil in these. And are a very small one. Yeah, no, as no. I mentioned, the characteristics, these are very small, tiny. Okay. Then we, do, we don't call them as blister. If they are a wider, larger ones, then we have to put a coil. But because you are, you are doing telescoping just to cross. Cavernous bend, whereas the vertebral bacillus are, it is relatively straight. Um, means uh, uh, the flow diverters, nowadays we have lengths of 40 uh, millimeters. So for telescoping earlier, I used, what I demonstrated is a braided stent. But braided stents were uh, lengthier ones. The most important thing is the sizing because the distal and the proximal uh, sizes will be different. So if you size it appropriately, the anchoring, the, the distal anchoring is the first thing. And then we, we uh, the, the wire is kept inside. The most important thing is the wire is kept inside and then the micro catheter is passed through the wire. So once the sizing is appropriate and the distal anchoring is adequate, there afterwards it becomes... Uh, you withdraw it and straighten the... Yeah. Uh, this. Yeah. So, uh, have you ever tried uh, doing this, taking your guiding catheter through the aneurysm sac and going up? Uh, That's it, that is another way of telescoping, actually. Uh, not for the posterior circulation, but for the anterior circulation. Even for crossing, sometimes we use the stent anchoring technique because the crossing itself can become a different, difficult issue. So, we use a stent retriever to anchor it and then we pass the micro.
रतलाल जी डॉक्टर दत्तराज सुहाकर जी एंड डॉक्टर यशपाल बुंदेला सर टू चेयर द सेशन एंड मॉडरेटर डॉक्टर नितिन डांगे so uh, welcome you all in the postless session i am it could be a heavy but i mean there we have very good speakers uh, from mexico chennai and uh, from japan to make you alert and awake so for first talk i invite dr john lujan from mexico for his talk on experience in hybrid neurosurgery at mexico city dr john to all the delegate to be alert we can ask question to you directly mahesh yeah good from arterial circulation we know that the residual aneurysm has a risk grade bleeding which can compromise life secondarily. Drake and Vanderlei report this complication in 33% on the small residual aneurysm and uh, up the 5-4% in large residual aneurysm. We must remember that the objective of aneurysm clipping surgery is to exclude the aneurysm from arterial circulation, preserve the vessel around the aneurysm, and identify the vessels beyond the visual field. Well, there are methods to visualize vascular flow such as indocinic green bioangiography. The use of indocinic green in humans is not authorized in our country. We do not have angiography equipment in our operative room, but we have adapted digital subtraction angiography CR X-ray machine for hybrid neurosurgery procedures. Initial uh, the vascular approach for intraoperative surgery. In this example, for terminal after approach, after lifting the skin flap, the temporal artery is dissected, and from there, we can lower the arrow three French catheter to be common carotid artery to average age was 80 year years. In this example, three-dimensional virtual reality is used for planning neurosurgical procedure. We observed the neck is part of the artery obtained the imaging intraoperative and geography in a lateral projection to visualize a comp and the distal flow to the aneurysm. We select semi curved clip for clipping before neck dissection and avoid temporal lobe retraction to prevent new aneurysm rupture. Then then we obtain an image in an intraoperative angiography where we observe definitive exclusion to the aneurysm and the persistent flow to the posterior communicant artery. Our preliminary report shows the majority of the aneurysm while with a thermoplex and observe uh, rupture the aneurysm. Move the clip to second and third clip in this level. Observe the brain parenchyma after clipping and finally intraoperative angiography to show the adequate exclusion the aneurysm and reconstruction communicant artery, which is corroborate the three-dimensional computed tomography and geography. As for the preoperative clinical status of patients, we observe the Hunichest scale of one and most patients for in the Fisher scale. In addition to the clinical characteristics enclosed in the circle for most patients. We raise a micro balloon catheter for proximal control during clipping. The balloon is inflated inside the skull to the petrol segment and we corroborate the absence of the intracranial flow. 
This is the balloon and not flow. When placing the first clip, we observe the root to a second incident of ophthalmic aneurysm, which requires the application to off straight mini clip. In the first time, first time in intraoperative angiography, we observe residual aneurysm. Later, with the balloon inflate, we place two clips, one anglet at 90 grades patients. Another example of an aneurysm at the top of the basilar artery in the middle portion of the clivus. We, we visualized the posterior clinoid one centimeter away from the neck. We decide to perform a posterior clinoidectomy after applying fibrin glue in the cavernous sinus. This is a medition. This is a application for a glue. Next, we can visualize part of the nearest dome. Rise a micro balloon catheter for flow control and intraoperative angiography. You observe the aneurysm clipping with a 90 degrees angle fenestrate clip. Is during to achieve the different exclusion surrounders by modified position of the clips. And since March of this year, we have started dual neurosurgery training because we are sure that the future of vascular surgery lies in the knowledge and dexterity of both procedures. Thank you so much. Uh, John for a nice presentation. Uh, anybody has any question or comment? Yeah, Professor Daljit. Yep. First of all, John, uh, welcome to Delhi. We didn't get official time to, you know, welcome you. Unfortunately, I couldn't recognize where are you sitting. So from uh, the department, we give you official welcome because you are some of those first people who are very enthusiastic in coming to Delhi. So welcome to Delhi. My Thank question you. is, are you doing regular intraoperative angiogram in uh, all no, the cases? We, uh, no. Uh, we released a protocol study. Uh, uh, um, uh, uh, to uh, five years ago. Now, in this time, uh, we recognize, recognize the angiography is principal to complex. Uh, no, I don't know, understand very well. Uh, very well. Uh, repeat the question, please. I'm asking you which operation theater table you use for surgery as well as for your DSA or angiography during the procedure. Is it a regular operation table? Operation table. Uh, I don't know. So the I question is, do you have a hybrid lab? No, no, not hybrid um, lab. Or you have a table where you operate upon, and it has an angiography facility. Same table you can use to do the angiography. Well, to in the first time, uh, the time to release angiography um, um, uh, is difficult. In now, uh, we use uh, the access femoral artery and the machine C, uh, C arm is, is uh, very easy to release the uh, procedure. So you are doing on the C arm? Yeah, he mentioned yeah. the first. Yeah. 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 Thank you very much, John, for your presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Now I call upon 
Rajneesh, our friend. <laughs> he will be talking on MCA aneurysms. Operative, operative outcome. <coughs> In uh, patient we have operated over a period. So <coughs> the city where I work, recently we have seen the there is a shift of practice towards the more and more endovascular. But this one aneurysm, uh, middle cerebral artery, uh, still uh, many patient comes for the surgery. Even after endovascular uh, colleagues, they uh, find difficulty in um, doing the procedure. So I'll be talking about the middle cerebral artery aneurysms, uh, our operative outcome. So these are the uh, good aneurysms still for the micro. So uh, I'll uh, show some of the examples. Uh, this is a very tiny aneurysm, maybe less than two millimeter size aneurysm. Uh, Sometimes they bleed uh, very massively. And this is one example of uh, this aneurysm. Not only the giant aneurysms, sometimes uh, with the very tiny aneurysms, also sometimes difficult to clip. Because the, the substance of the aneurysm sac, you can see here, it's slipping out. You are not able to, a very broad neck aneurysm, and sometimes it is difficult to, uh, so, so the, the making the, the bifurcation is, is very important. So I tried applying another clip there, but it was compromising the flow of the distal MCA. So we have accepted this, this is the clipping. This aneurysm, I would, uh, this patient presented with the massive uh, uh, ICH and um, she was in a grade four, five subarachnoid hemorrhage and um, she was in a grade four, five subarachnoid hemorrhage. And this is a M2, M3 segment aneurysm and uh, we had operated this patient. So this is at exposure. Uh, this is uh, MC bifurcation and the distal to that is an aneurysm, is a, a large to giant aneurysm. The problem here is the large hard thrombus, which is not uh, bro broken into pieces, so I had to use a CUSA to, uh, to reduce the size of this plaque and slowly in a piecemeal, we have removed this, uh, the hard plaque. As you see the plaque in the carotid endocrine, this was the kind of a very, very uh, hard plaque. So. So this is separated all around the sac and Another aneurysm, uh, broad neck uh, rejected by the endovascular group and then we have operated. So I will not go into the details of these videos because of the uh, time shortage. Uh, and this is uh, one kind of emergency you get with very, very large uh, hematoma, small aneurysm and you have to do sometimes decompressive craniectomy also. Another patient with a grade five subarachnoid hemorrhage. This is one aneurysm, this is unplaid, but who has presented with the right-sided weakness, which was associated with the slurring. There was a partial recovery. And uh, this is the DSA, which is showing an aneurysm at the bifurcation, which is large. Patient was discharged because of the acute onset uh, stroke and uh, came back after uh, three weeks, um, it was coiled. But after three months, uh, the, the repeat DSA showing the aneurysm is growing again. So 
the option remained either recoil or do a surgical uh, clipping and uh, removal of coils. So we uh, operated this patient. We have clipped this aneurysm and we had put a MC, STMC bypass and this is the post-operative. Grading, uh, mostly in grade 1 and 2 or 75 patients in grade 3, 11 patients. 16 patients were uh, poor grade uh, subarachnoid hemorrhage, mostly small aneurysms, uh, their weight were large and three giant aneurysms. These were the intraoperative complications, uh, six had a rupture, vasospasm, hemiparesis, CSF leak. So the outcome, if we see here, the grade one and two patients, no so we, we had a very good outcome in grade one to three patients. There was only mortality that was in the grade four and five patients. So in conclusion, the microsurgical clipping is highly effective method of treating MC aneurysms. It is safe and durable option. And we have to ex exclude aneurysm from the circulation and at the same time, we have to preserve the distal circulation that is uh, very important for the very good outcome. Otherwise, they can have a catastrophic uh, deficits. Thank you very much. <coughs> Any questions? This intraoperative rupture is a complex beyond trial. The chairpersons, teachers, colleagues, and friends. Uh, I know this is a very controversial topic to speak on, but then there should be some clarity on what we are going to do because this is one of the very common problems which we see in our day-to-day -day practice. We don't have any doubt now that Moyamaya disease, STMC bypass works well and there is no ambiguity, a lot of papers, we had an entire session. But the same thing when it comes to a role on atherosclerotic occlusion of an ICA or a M1 stenosis, we don't have the data and uh, there are a lot of controversies and ambiguities in the management. Two trials uh, put a lot of trouble for the neurosurgical community by saying, one is the 1984 STMC bypass trial, the next this cost trial, which showed that STMC bypass is not going to work for patients with this type of occlusion. However, we know that there are a lot of flaws in the study, the inclusion criteria was not good, and the lot of perioperative stroke, which actually pulled the results out, and we are not relying much on the study. Subsequently, there are a lot of other papers which came supporting the role of STMC bypass even in these cases. The real-time scenario is that you do get referrals. So why this difference in between patients? So whenever there's a large vessel occlusion, name it ICA or MCA, it all depends on how much, how good are the collaterals in the given patient. You cannot broaden the patient's criteria saying some trial is not working, that this. So everything is, you look at the, each patient differently. There are a lot of now investigations to work on these patients. So those patients who have a good collateral, they remain asymptomatic. However, those who have this type of hemotomy failure, they go on to all these problems. So what really happens is just so based on MRI perfusion, you do half an hour post uh, completion of this. You compare the perfusion pre and post -trial. So I'm just going to take you some examples. This is a 42-year-old female who I did a carotid occlusion, anterior ligation from 12 years back when I was a GIFMAR. This patient was doing very well. Three years, four years later, she started complaining of tingling and numbness, paresthesias, and then we did the DSA, and we see that there's significant capillary filling delay, and this is after after three, four years. So we did that. Di that time, it was MRI perfusion was not there. This is almost eight years back. So we did a spec CT pre and post time to be uh, asymptomatic later. Multiple such examples, you can see you small very well. This is a young soft engineer who presented to the emergency with a stroke. And when we did, it was at a multiple admit under neurophysician. And there's a chronic stenosis with a hemodynamic instability this time. And you can see that the MCA, ICA is fully stenosed. And this patient having multiple small DAs, which we was telling in the uh, history. We did an almost an emergency STMC bypass because he was continuing to deteriorate. And we can see stabilized and further improved very well. This is a very atypical case. You see, she, she was in uh, Andhra and she came to her daughter's house. She collapsed. It was a large infarct, and you see that the right ICA is occluded, left ICA is occluded, said brain is suffering, and we did a left strip bypass, and she became symptomatically better. Other examples, you can see a 42-year-old left lower limb, limb shaking TA intracranial bypass in select group of patients. So this is my own perf uh, experience for the past 15 years. We can see the various publications have uh, proved that. So there's a lot of patients who benefited from this. So this is a total of 56 patients in the last eight, 15 years. And you can see that everything into the spec CT then CT perfusion, last five years, MR perfusion gives very good results. So I'm doing Diamox challenge and MR perfusion, all these cases, document perfusion, uh, mismatch, and then do bypass. So only for at later data, so not because of the bypass. So we have good results in this. So I would like to conclude that. Don't 
go by the study of cause. Which While you are selecting these patients with Dimox, how do you manage the patients? These all will be on antiplatelet. When do you stop them? When do you restart them? That is one thing. And uh, secondly, uh, what is your uh, role of best medical management? One important criteria in that is blood pressure monitoring. Yeah. So these patients may have be on anti anti uh, hypertensives, and they may have low blood pressure, which may not, which may be neglected. So have you? What is your experience in such patients? Yeah, definitely, yeah, definitely. So the question number one is: so those patients. The Best medical, they are dual antiplatelets. Most of these patients I do stop clopilet five days before, but continue echo aspirin tablet even on the day of surgery. I don't stop aspirin because we are afraid of uh, graft thrombosis because of that. The second question is about the BP management. As you know, cardiologists are in a different dimension. So they, for them, the BP, are they already their code, they already have a lot of strokes, so your BP has to be controlled well. So the hemodynamic concept is very, even among, I'm sorry to say this, even among physicians. And that time we selected the, the, the two two ring clips, penetrated clips, like this, and there is a small space, and then uh, our length is uh, just enough to uh, just the size to the uh, before the anterior and another. this is the uh, aneurysm, and uh, like that, and uh, superficial artery is coming like right here, and that means that the uh, uh, if you did a uh, uh, remnant is the uh, end of the clip, it will be the growth. But the, uh, if there is uh, the wall of the aneurysm, anterior artery is coming from the wall of the aneurysm, this is a key point. Uh, maybe stent is important and, remo and remove the temporary clip or the temporary clip off, and then the uh, patient is okay. And so that uh, we, the surgery, here you see only the, the, the perforator is coming from the aneurysm wall. Then uh, this is the only the way to preserve the uh, perforators. And in case of the artery perforator arising from the aneurysm wall. And now we are doing the Sanoseng of the Academy of Aneurysm Surgery. It was, uh, it was uh, the postponed three years being internal carted. And then uh, but uh, this aneurysm wall is, looks very thin, very thin. I worry about that. But anyway, the same uh, pattern of the, as usual, uh, usual. then uh, the, this is suction decompression. Now the neck was uh, uh, the, the, uh, controlled, uh, artery internal coated here. And look at this is very thin wall. But I worry about, but uh, we have to make it. And uh, this was a little bit uh, seat. You can put the clip on, like this way. And maybe this is a little bit, uh, bionet ring is uh, weak. So we can the uh, curve the ring clip. Uh, little, uh, this is a little bit narrow, then we change the, the, the uh, clip position uh, using the another nervous seat like that. And also, uh, this time, uh, maybe you have to use a straight ring clip. That is much stronger of the uh, uh, clip. Then uh, we release uh, the temporary clip off and then uh, uh, lapter point is small and around the neck, around the neck, very close to the neck, you have to use a seat under the clip. This is the one of the key points. And possible because of the, the uh, we are uh, doing that, because of the outside clean uh, approach, but the uh, uh, intervention is the inside approach, but the surgery is the outside approach, then it's possible. And not the clipping but the, the uh, surgery, uh, but uh, the, the just the selection of the uh, between the two, and uh, easy for uh, approaching is maybe clipping is better, and e e uh, but the difficult for approaching is maybe IVR is better. Surgery is the outside approach, of, uh, then uh, of the artery, then attach the intima of the artery by uh, uh, by the clip, and 
change the shape of the aneurysm by dome coagulation uh, that, that was, uh, I uh, mentioned yesterday and uh, enforcement of the wrapping that was uh, doing the outside of those. Then the growth rate, maybe we are, uh, this is a skip uh, after three months afterward, but not satis uh, uh, so, uh, satisfactory. And, but uh, someday, surgeon is uh, disappeared. Maybe uh, the, the result will be the, the same as the European uh, ISAT. So I am I'm very aware, afraid. So the aesthetical of the aneurysm surgery, surgery is outside the throat, so the possible to coagulate of the aneurysm lap and possible to bypass also. And key point of the surgery, make before the preoperative image and know how to move the hand. Not, not how to move the hand, but how to, to stabilize the hand. That is the most important. And doing the difficult thing in an easy way, is that, that is a master. And uh, uh, three key points, learn from the master's hand, mimic it, make your own original style, then you will be a god. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Professor Sano. Uh, very informative and quite a learning, inspirational talk as, as always. Any questions? Not visualized, maybe we are taking the, the endoscope and where it is. And we have to make the hand to remember where is the point of the perforator is coming. Then uh, we select the length of the, and then put the clip on. So the, you have to make image and how, uh, which part will be under, sometimes taking of the a mirror or some endoscope of the, the assistant, then. Uh, first of all, thank you very much for having me here, especially Dr. Anita. So I'll be speaking on radial access for neurointervention. So this was a picture I took while on the morning walk and here I could see this, sea, uh, this tree and you can see there are uh, two new branches which are coming out from this old tree. And I believe this is the way it was trying to adapt to the new environment and this is the philosophy of the life and in intervention also we should continuously thrive to uh, adapt to the new things and one of them is now uh, radial approach so why do we need this radial approach first of all it is a superficially located artery there are no significant structures in close proximity any injury has less uh, detrimental as compared to the femoral there are also less puncture site complication because it is easily compressible and there are no special closure devices are required after the procedure. Also, patient can be mobilized early. Uh, for diagnostic, we just discharge the patient after one hour of the diagnostic NGO. And it is more comfortable to the patient because you, uh, incidence of back pain is less because they don't have to stay supine for a longer period of time. So other advantages are in case of obese patient and coagulopathy and patient anticoagulation. So this was one of the prototype patient in which we use a radial approach and to 3 mm. Whereas in India, if I get a 2 mm artery, I'm happy. A cocktail, which is usually a combination of heparin, verapamil or diltiazem or nitroglycerin. So after that, I'm not going to the puncture step. They are just like femoral, but you just have to be a little bit careful because the caliber of the artery is small. And then after your sheath is inserted, you just administer this cocktail over a rate of, uh, uh, over a period of one minute. So uh, this is uh, one trial that we are currently doing and in which we have randomized patient into NTG plus verapamil versus NTG alone. And among the 54 patients right now, we have seen that there is no, another approach is distal radial access. And this is again uh, our experience that we published in Neurology India. And the theoretical advantage of using a distal radial approach is that you puncture the superficial, uh, the deep branch of the radial artery, whereas the superficial branch is preserved. So theoretically, the chances of uh, any hand ischemia is less. So you can see here the sheath which is lying in the, inserted to the anatomical snuff on the left vertebral side. So again, you are on the left vertebral side. So again, you can see here there is an acute bend when we are putting the catheter into the left ICA from the left radial side. So it is a good idea, always take a check run because sometimes you can encounter these variants which are brachioradialis or hypobrachioradialis variant and we have seen that these are prone to spasm. So your character getting stuck is more common in these cases. So again, uh, it is a very good idea to take a roadmap image because you can encounter 
these loops which can be uh, seen frequently in the older patients. So if there are partial loops, uh, usually there is no problem, but sometimes you can have this complete 360 degree loop and here you have to do certain uh, procedure like balloon assisted tracking, so I will not be able to take that on this presentation. So this is our study which was published in, you can see that sub uh, tortuous subclavian can uh, pose certain challenges. You can see that sub uh, tortuous subclavian can uh, pose certain challenges for you, but usually if you t uh, take a long sheath, for example, I use a blast sheath for these most of these cases, and this can make your life easy because of this tortuosity for the radial. And but sometimes you can see that subclavian as well as vertebral are tortuous. So you can see the great amount of tortuous uh, traction over the vertebral artery. So it is better you just convert to femoral rather than causing any harm to the patient. So another variant you can see, the, again I was taking, it was right radial diagnostic. So the catheter was repeatedly entering into the descending aorta. So in this case, when, when, when you are seeing this phenomena, you should suspect that this is a case of aberrant subclavian artery and this is not a suitable approach for the radial. But if you encounter a bovine arch, your entering into the left CCA is quite straightforward and it is a favorable uh, thing for the uh, radial approach. So I'll be showing a few cases of therapeutic neurointervention and uh, I, although I use in most of the cases, but it is always radial wisely rather than radial first because many of your cases may not be suitable as of now. So these are few of our original studies which have been published for radial and I will show you a few cases you could do this ACOM coiling. But particularly in the left side, pushed, uh, uh, pushed back into the aorta, so we have to use a long sheet in these cases. So this is a case for flow diverter. In this case, the artery diameter was only 1.8 mm, but still we could put a 6F long sheet through it and could perform our uh, FD for this uh, residual aneurysm. Another case of left radial access, we now reserve therapeutic from left radial only if there is a left vertebral pathology. So this was the left pike aneurysm. Directly to the 6F sheet, this uh, uh, guiding catheter can be taken into the left vertebral. So this is an interesting case. Uh, this is a right PCI dissecting aneurysm with subclavian steel. You can see this left vertebral is taking care of the right subclavian also. So this artery becomes very important and we don't want to uh, injure it by any means. Also this patient had subclavian stenosis as well as uh, stenosis of the right ICA and the left side we could, uh, uh, everything was supplied from the left side. So here we took a right radial access and, and this was the armadillo catheter. This is the first Indian case by this uh, radial specific catheter and we could perform our FD with a coil and got a good result in this case. So this is the last case of 60 year male with basilar artery occlusion and in, to conclude femoral artery has been a long term friend and now radial artery has entered and in, to conclude femoral artery has been a long term friend and now radial artery has entered your life like a lover and she can be irritable initially but once you get a hang of it it can be a lifelong romance with the artery so finally the radial wisely should be used rather than radial first thank you very much So, a nice presentation. So, what this new lower can give a complication? I mean, like, what are the... But if the artery diameter is 2.4, you can go ahead with 8F also. So, 1.8 mm, we could pu uh, uh, put a 6F uh, blast sheet and there was no issues with that. Good. Thank you. Yeah, can you do Any questions? Can you do all six vessels with it? Sorry? Can you do all six vessels? Yes, yes. The only problem is it takes a learning curve, particularly I'm telling you right side CCA, right vertebral, they are easy. The left
Expo bypass, radial artery both end prepared, ST was prepared for insurance bypass, ECA prepared as a donor, and after that radial artery was brought from neck end to head end, then first STMC insurance bypass, after that radial artery M2 cranial end bypass with atoproline, then ECA radial artery anastomosis with 6 proline. And after completion of all the bypasses, I see was ligated at the neck. This is a case of right P1 dissecting aneurysms. It was partially thrombosed and compressing the brain stem. In this case, this is the operative video, this is the basilar artery, and this is the PC PCA, which is physiformly dilated and dissected. So taking basilar control, we clipped the P1. The PCOM bypass, in this case, this is my first maxillary bypass, radial artery graft was a bit more re than required. This is the bypass, it was managed after IC ligation. This is the bypass has a definite role in traumatic dissection also. The ruptured SCP causing MCA dissection. After bypass, the dissection is corrected at follow-up. In CCF, direct CCF managed with bypass. This is a case of giant mid Invasive middle fossa lesion, uh, IC was encased, did STMC double barrel bypass and cavernous in a case of growth hormone secreting adenoma during surgery, it was cut and handed over to me and I did STMC double barrel bypass emergency basis and transcavernous removal of the adenoma is doing well. So in conclusion, scope of microvascular anastomosis and microvascular bypass is extensive and uh, outcome was quite satisfactory in my early series, strong motivation, perseverance, lab practice, proper guidance and definitely opportunities required to be a microvascular bypass surgeon. Thank you very much. Carotid body tumors. Good afternoon, chairpersons, uh, respected friends. So uh, my talk will be on carotid body tumors. And the first slide that I really am proud of to present today is uh, uh, we all have this uh, thank you slides, thank you the organizing chairpersons. But for me, it is like homecoming. And this is my gratitude slide for all my teachers who have made me whatever I have become today. So this is thank you, all of you. Thank you to all my teachers for what I have become and what I become in future. So what I speak of is a group of tumors which are a part of paragangliomas or chemodectomas. The carotid body tumors are the most common head and neck tumors which are primarily supplied by the extra, my opinion, wound infection, slight vocal cord palsy which resolves after a certain period of time can be called as a morbidity or not be called as a morbidity, it depends. So we didn't have any mortality as such but the morbidity can be taken on a face value. So the first index case that we have is a 28-year female, painless progressive swelling, hoarseness of voice present, no vocal palsy, no focal neurological deficit. This is the lesion splaying the internal and external carotid artery. You see the lesion is well below the skull base and it is nicely splaying the uh, vessels. We used to do this angiogram in our initial case series. We were apprehensive of the case. We were kind of going ahead with the surgeries. And now we don't do any more angiograms in our patients because it doesn't really help us much in our surgical planning or in any form thereafter. So this patient went under a standard uh, carotid anatomy incision anterior to neck. We take out the lymph node at the start of the surgery because we really want to know whether it is a malignant carotid body tumor or a benign carotid tumor. Tough part where the bifurcation of the common carotid artery is there. That is where the tumor arises from and you have to really, that tumor is stuck over there, really take it out. And this is the specimen. So you see that the biopsy came out as carotid body tumors negative for metastasis. But things get really challenging over here. A doctor coming to you. Uh, working, worked out for an hypertension, painless progressive swelling, no deficits as such. And the lesion you see on the CT is going up till the skull base. It is encasing the both, the, rather than going to the tip of the mastoid, we go behind the tip of the mastoid to get that extra space to work upon. So this is the uh, patients cre create those spaces all around the lesion and take out all the feeders so that you can really take out the a lesion at the end. So uh, there was one video that was shown by Dr. Anand at the, uh, for the same topic and at that he showed that he had to cut the external carotid 
to go beyond the lesion, but uh, you really want to preserve all the vascular territories. So you see, we are going all around that you can really take it out and uh, take out the lesion in one. You really don't want to sacrifice any vasculature, be it external carotid also. So this was the biopsy of the patient, again a benign disease having no malignant potential. So you have to take it out and cure the patient for lifelong. But this is again for my residents. Uh, for here I come as a resident. I don't come as a uh, teacher or a, a neurosurgeon who has 10 years of practice. So if you really want to go up in the neurosurgical hierarchy, you have to start at the bottom and then go up. As in the talk, previous talk, you have to have perseverance, you have to have lab training, you have to have that uh, 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 someone guiding above you so that you can really have that faith to do that first case and then go and build upon it. So once you start your neurosurgical residency, all residents should train upon microvascular carotid. So you start with carotid anatomy and go above that. Subspecialization is the need of our, if you really want to be a micro neurosurgeon, Thorough biochemical and anatomical radiological analysis is critical before any surgeries of CBTs. Removing carotid body tumors, saving carotid artery and nearby nerves is the surgery and it's a very happy surgery. Thank you so much. Nice presentation, Dr. Ravi Shankar. Uh, out of all uh, eight cases, how many of uh, these are type four? Uh, that uh, means, uh, there were uh, two type 3 uh, in our series, uh, the one I showed and uh, one more case. So any of uh, these uh, you sacrifice any major No, vessels? we had no vessel sacrifice in our series. Any questions from audience or comments? like to preserve the glossopharyngeal nerve in such cases? Uh, there are two, three uh, nerves that we are really concerned with. One is vagus, one is the superior laryngeal nerve, yeah. one is the hypoglossal nerve. Ravi, Thank you, sir. Appreciate. Uh, did you get any recurrence of any, with this madness? I think uh, the, our series is not very long. It is from 2020 onwards. So still now, still now in post-operative MRI is also six months post-op MRI, we didn't have any recurrence. Very good. Thank you. So the next speaker is Dr. Vineet Banga. He'll be talking on black and white or shades of gray, difficult treatment decisions in acute stroke management. Good evening, everyone. Good evening, everyone. So uh, I'm one of the neurologists who does intervention and stroke has been my passion. So uh, we know mechanical thrombectomy is through which I'll uh, let, uh, let the people think that uh, what made us think whether to go for mechanical thrombectomy or not. So uh, the first case uh, story starts at 11.30 a.m. in the morning, 37 year old female, teacher by occupation, uh, uh, history of hypothyroidism, fast history of uh, some transient weakness of the right side of the body a year back. She had sudden onset blurring at 9 a.m., which recovered spontaneously. And around an hour later, she tried. The grip further improved. The NIHSS tried. The grip further improved. The NIHSS came down to one. And this was the MRI that we had at 12 p.m. So m some diffusion restriction uh, in the left MCA territory, but uh, nothing. So uh, we decided, okay, like. Uh, now, what will you do, whether you go for thrombolysis or not? But we decided, okay, she's a young female, she's having recurrent TIAs, though NHSS is borderline, we decided, okay, let's go for thrombolysis. And the patient also started feeling a bit better, but uh, if this would have been the case, I would not have been presenting here. So, uh, after around 48 milligrams of TPA, the patient CT angiography. Patient was very, very irritable, took some time for us to stabilize, and this was the CT angiography. The CT aspects looks quite good, but uh, we don't see any of left IC. So it's a tandem occlusion, aspects of eight. Now it is 3.30, so she had TIAs at 10 a.m. So at this point of time, uh, the neurointerventionist, me, was contacted. We advised mechanical thrombectomy, but as it happens, it's a costly procedure, a private hospital. The family was confused, they needed time, they decided to wait. 
So we also decided to wait till the time they give consent. And uh, they want the case summary when you hand it over, they consult it like, and uh, they want the case summary when you hand it over, they consult it like two, three uh, other centers. And finally, repeated counseling and discussions, they agreed for intervention. But beca because it is now 7 p.m., it started at 10 a.m., now it's 7 p.m., six hours. So we decided, okay, let's do an MRI to see whether there's any penumbra or infarct or not, because this center doesn't have a CT perfusion software. And this was the MRI. Patchy infarcts in the left MCA territory, if you'll go for a diffusion aspects, it's quite low. So it's, it kind of looks like a malignant infarct. A large core, but significant penumbra. Now what in next should you do? Will you do mechanical thrombectomy? The question was, the patient was young. Husband and wife, they used to live alone uh, with each other. A husband used to leave home early and he left home early at around 8 a.m. He came back 9.30 p.m. around 12 hours later to find that the patient is uh, lying in the bed without clothes with weakness of right side of the body. Reached hospital around an hour later. On examination, it was a frank MCA syndrome, NIHSS of 14. Provisional diagnosis was a partial anterior circulation syndrome. Now, what is the onset? Now, wh whether you call it a wake-up stroke or how do you call it? Like, it's a wake-up stroke or non-wake-up or a defined window. So we decided, okay, let's have a circumstantial evidence. And this was the MRI that we had uh, when the patient landed in hospital. So the patient had a left MCA territory infarct, but there was no diffusion flare mismatch. So all of this infarct probably is uh, three to four and a half hour older. But there was uh, blooming and present on, uh, so there were prominent veins on the left side, which told, tells us that obviously there, there is penumbra and there are chances if you go for mechanical thrombectomy will be good. But what will be the window? It's 12 hours. So it's 12 hours, whether it is wake up or non-wake up, what are the guidelines? The guidelines say, okay, if the NIHSS is more than uh, six, you go for it. Uh, you have to have a CT perfusion or MR diffusion flare mismatch or a clinical diffusion. The wife had a stroke in between because she was undressed. She probably tried to go to the washroom and when she was coming back, she had this episode. So it was probably uh, in favor of stroke after 8 a.m. The window was 15 hours. So we decided, okay, the guidelines are for dawn and diffuse. Because if you consider this patient went to bed at 9 p.m. and it is now at 11 p.m. in the next day. So the window becomes more than 24 hours. Then you cannot do it. So unless you have a circumstantial evidence of it being in stroke after 8 a.m. in the morning, you cannot go for mechanical thermectomy as per guidelines because then it crosses 24 hours. We went ahead, we decided, okay, let's do a CT perfusion. So uh, this was the CT perfusion. The CT aspects look, uh, no, doesn't look that good. There's left MC occlusion. This was the CT aspects. So there was discrepancy between CT and MRI. The CT aspects looks bad, while the MRI aspects look quite good. So we decided, okay, we go with an MR aspects, mechanical thrombectomy, like to go for it or not. So we, we thought probably she has ICAT with <laughs> but whether we, we should go for mechanical thrombectomy in this case or not. We decided, okay, let's have an MR. MR showed the same, decided about thrombolysis. Now, whether to go for mechanical thrombectomy or not, low INHSS, risk-benefit ratio, cost. The only deficit the patient has is my <laughs> decided, okay, let's not go for MT. And this is the infarct the next day. The whole of the PCA territory is gone, but the patient improved surprisingly. So these are difficult decisions. Like some of these patients I showed, the NIHSS was high. The, the infarct core was that we should consider while in our practice because uh, in India, like other than obviously science, science there are other socio-economical parameters also. Good afternoon. I will be speaking on the topic carotid cavernous fistula. These are a rare pathology with an abnormal communication between the ICA and the cavernous sinus. The classical dentist trials is not seen in all the patients. The other uh, symptoms could be ophthalmoplasia, visual loss, and patient may have IC bleed. Uh, these are basically located on either side of the spinoid sinus. Uh, they are usually multi-compartment, uh, unlike uh, classically described in the textbook as a single venous channel. The inflow is from the vein and uh, from the jugular vein, rosal sinus, inferior petrosal sinus. So uh, the inferior petrosal sinus forms the workhorse for the transvenous approaches for the treatment of these lesions. Uh, it was, classi it was uh, classified by Barrow into four types, 
type A is a direct fistula, whereas uh, rest of them are indirect fistulas, basically dural fistulas. Uh, trauma is the most common etiology of the type A fistula, uh, the other reasons being aneurysm or uh, uh, transpenodal surgery. Uh, it's very difficult to know the cause in indirect fistula. Uh, the reasons could be breakdown in the dural arteries or in patients with uh, cavernous sinus thrombosis, there might be opening of the abnormal channels. The imaging is basically by CT, MRI and the DSA. On CT, we can make out proptosis, uh, the enlarged extracular muscles, the dilated SOV, and also the uh, enlarged uh, cavernous sinus and the associated intracranial injuries can be made out. The findings on the CT can also be made out on the MRI with additional findings of flow voids in the cavernous sinus. DSA remains the gold standard. Uh, on this we can, since it's a dynamic, so it's a gold standard compared to the CT angio or the MR, MR angio. On this we can uh, disease of the intracranium. And uh, in the earlier days they used to use a wooden block to compress the carotids in the neck and there was resolution of the symptoms. The next leap in the treatment uh, was by Walter Dendy. Uh, he used to operate on the aneurysm and he applied the same concept that these lesions can be trapped. So he started trapping the lesions. Uh, but in patients who didn't have uh, enough cross circulation, uh, the patient didn't do well. So this kind of pushed us to direct surgical treatment. So this was uh, started by Parkinson. He started operating on these lesions by directly opening the cavernous sinus at the fistula site. But uh, this was done under uh, hypothermic uh, cardiac arrest and there was heavy blood loss and the patient used to have post-operative coagulopathies. So this all kind of pushed us to the endovascular treatment. Uh, uh, treatment pro uh, approved through the endovascular route was the transarterial embolization of the balloon. And the credit goes to Serbankino who was a former uh, Soviet Union uh, neurointensist. The other current material used in the embolization are the coils and the liquid embolications. So the management is mainly uh, either conservative or endo endovascular depending upon the uh, type of the fistula and the symptoms. And very rarely we can, uh, uh, radio surgery can be considered and very, very rarely surgical option is the choice. So conservative management, fistula and fistula and uh, we just went in transarterially. Uh, put a coils and the fistula has completely disappeared. So the advantage of using coil is that they are precise, reliable, they can be redeployed and uh, uh, in case if they are not deployed then they can be adjusted also. Coming to the second case, uh, this was a case of post RTA, right CCF. Uh, uh, so we went transarterially, uh, cannulated the cavernous sinus, put in some coils and we started putting, uh, we used some uh, glue, onyx and the fistula was closed. The disadvantage of using only coils is that uh, the rate of thrombosis is, uh, since there was a compartmentalization of the coils, uh, my catheter backed out. So I lost the access. So the one of the uh, drawback of using only coils is that over a period of time you may lose the access. So the choice was either to go transvenous or to do a parent artery occlusion. So I went in transvenously, put in some coils and glue and uh, there was complete resolution of the reflux and of the fistula too. Uh, this is the post-operative. See that uh, the only venous channel open is the SOV. So we went in transvenous route. Uh, we opened the SOV with the help of the open, direct uh, opening of the SOV. Did a coil simple coil embolization of the uh, cavernous sinus and there was complete resolution of the symptoms. This was a study conducted by my colleague uh, under the guidance of Dr. Daldit sir. Uh, here wherein they monitor the intrafistula pressure. So if there was a drop in the intrafistula pressure by more than 50%, then you can, you could wait another 20 minutes, 30 right CCF. Uh, so we just did a parent artery occlusion and uh, uh, patient did fine. Coming to the treatment of the uh, indirect fistulas. So indirect fistulas, the treatment of choice is through the transvenous route. The only, uh, in patients whom it is a traumatic indirect fistula, then we can use a transarterial route. The transarterial route because multiple feeders are need to be embolized and there is a risk of cranial nerve pulses. Uh, the outcome of the embolization is uh, with uh, studies conducted outside and uh, our own study, uh, there is success rates of around 90 to 95 percent. To the last talk of the session and the conference, so I request Dr. Pratyan Sharma to present his talk on ruptured basilar artery perforator aneurysm, diagnostic and therapeutic concomitant. Good evening everyone. 
Uh, sincere thanks to the organizing committee for giving me the opportunity to speak. So this talk is about a very rare condition which is often under-reported, under-diagnosed, and despite the advancement of uh, intervention modalities, still under-treated. Uh, we all know that uh, the anterior, circulator, anterior circulation perforator aneurysms are a rare cause of uh, SAH, ruptured uh, aneurysmal SAH, contributing to less than 1%. But basilar perforator aneurysms are still rare and till date only around 70 odd cases are reported. Uh, these aneurysms are notorious uh, of escaping uh, their detection in the initial DSA images in view of their very small morphology escaping the attention of the reporting uh, interventionist. They can mimic basilar perforator, uh, they can mimic basilar, uh, sorry, they can mimic basilar blister aneurysms. Uh, they, tend to undergo spontaneous thrombosis uh, because where you can see the relation of the different type of uh, basilar perforator aneurysm with the parent vessel. So this is a retrospective study of a very small cohort of around five patients. All of them had initial uh, see there's a thick SH in the CT uh, involving the posterior fossa. This is the initial DSA. This, as I told, these aneurysms are notorious of escaping their detection in the initial DSA images. This is the first DSA where you couldn't see the couldn't see the, uh, the trace of any basilar perforator aneurysm. And we repeated the DSA again after a week where we can see clearly now that there's a, uh, there's a tiny, uh, there's a tiny perforator was placed to cover the aneurysm segment. Uh, this is another, this is a third patient where you can see that this is a type 2A category. This is the placement of the flow diverter. In addition to the, uh, the, uh, the, the, the perforator where from the artery, the addition to the, uh, the, uh, the, the perforator where from the artery, the aneurysm is arising, also tend to cause blockages of another additional perforators, which can sometimes complicate uh, as a stroke. In this patient, we had this uh, complication who had basilar, who had brainstem stroke. Unfortunately, we couldn't save him despite uh, performing decompressive craniectomy. Uh, this is the small cohort uh, where. So in our experience, all the, flow, all the patients who had initial DSA, initial negative DSA after the acute phase, uh, all of them were again uh, brought back to the NGO suite to repeat another uh, DSA after a gap of one week. And in, in the second DSA, if the uh, DSA shows any basilar perforator aneurysm, it was decided to go ahead with endovascular procedure under, uh, because the DAPT cover was not there. In those cases, we usually give breathing integral techniques, unfortunately, were, uh, didn't produce any encouraging results in any of the subset. Integral techniques, unfortunately, were, uh, didn't produce any encouraging results in any of the subset, any of the series which has been published in literature. There have been reports of treating this patient, uh, this category of patients with only stents, only overlapping stents, flow diversion, and also electrolysis. So this is the latest. Uh, uh, this, is the, this is the latest uh, paper, which uh, had a, uh, which was a, uh, which is a better analysis and systemic review of non-trunk basilar perforator aneurysm, where they compared the results of conservative uh, conservative management only with endovascular intervention, and they concluded that the long-term uh, long-term results of endovascular treatment are encouraging. However, conservative management also uh, was not too inferior if we see the comparison. Now, this is in this, in this subset, they only included three patients who didn't do any flow diverter or stand placement. What they did was they just cannulated the, cannulated the aneurysm with a micro wire and subsequently connected with the electrolytic, uh, uh, just like uh, electrolytic coil detachment system, they do electrolysis. So the initial results are encouraging. However, this is a very small cohort of only three cases. So to conclude this, till now, there is not enough data in literature to conclusively opine the usefulness of flow diversion. Patients who had repeated this can be useful in published literature. Initial reports of FD are encouraging, and this treatment strategy for ruptured basilar perforator aneurysm achieved a high rate of angiography occlusion. On second case occasion, also the FD failed to remain in the site of the aneurysm. That is, missed the actual site of aneurysm in the second case. First agreed, yeah. but you must have learned yeah. the reason the first case why it happened second time. Part two, another part, you, did you place an overlapping stent or an additional stent because you could not push the uh, FD towards the uh, aneurysm site. That means you placed just the stent over the aneurysm and did it suffice? So uh, we, initially did a, we initially did a flow diverter placement, uh, part two I'm answering first. So and after that we did an overlapping stand because we did not withdraw the microcatheter. We just went inside the FD and because the FD was, uh, the second case which I showed particularly belonged to type 2A. 
which is almost at the basilar bifurcation. And uh, also we found that the placement was not adequate and because the patient was very young, to have a further cushion of safety, we deployed an atlas stand, open cell stand, because uh, it was easy to place an open cell stand and we didn't withdraw the microcatheter. Duration of uh, complete aneurysmal angiographic occlusion. So we need to find a balance between uh, angiographic rate of occlusion as well as perforator patency. So second case, we planned itself like that. The first case, it's shortened. That's why over it's a narrow, uh, small cell. The space is less. But did it augment? You want to say you augmented Yeah, we the augmented project? it. We augmented with an overlapping stand. But did it suffice? Because yeah, it was suffice. Because, because in the open cell. So in the angiography, I can show you. Uh, I didn't show you, I think, in the slide. We repeated an angiography. Uh, in the, uh, the follow-up angio, which was repeated after six months, there was no trace of the aneurysm. So I think it was sufficient enough. We have evidence about that. But, but there was no aneurysm in the first angio also, <laughs> which was missed in the first angio. I just first angio, the initial angio was missing. The direction of the vessel hitting a bifurcation of uh, a perforator. So what literature says about the generation? about? So, sir, in literature, the anterior circulation perforator aneurysms are more common compared to posterior circulation aneurysms, and uh, they contribute to roughly less than one percent of ruptured aneurysmal SH in literature. But almost all, almost all the anterior circulation perforator aneurysm in literature has been conservatively managed because it is very because of the caliber of the vessel is too small. It, they think that uh, the results of FD may be too risky to risk, so mostly they were observed, managed with conservative management in anterior circulation if you study the literature. Mm -hmm. Regarding the management, uh, this is the mechanism of uh, development of these aneurysms, it is said that the so literature is very sparse. Uh, whatever I could read, they say is that this aneurysm may be present developmentally, and uh, maybe, maybe they, co they cause rupture at a later stage. Exact cause of rupture, I'm not very sure, but like aneurysm ruptures patients who are smokers, who have got hypertension, maybe these are predisposing factors, but exact etiogenesis of perforator aneurysms, I'm not very sure, sir. Okay. Well, thank you. As we move towards the conclusion of the conference, uh, we will have the last, as we move towards the conclusion of the conference, uh, we will have the last validatory function and closing ceremony which will be followed by, which will be including the awards dist uh, prize distribution for the award papers and the e-posters. For this, I would like to invite our distinguished members of the Cerebrovascular Society. First, I guess we have to just wait, at least the chairs are in place. So first of all, I would like to invite uh, Dr. Prabit uh, Pradita Tripathi, uh, the Secretary of CVSI. So please, sir, kindly come on stage. Next, I invite uh, Dr. Manmohan Singh, sir, the Treasurer of CVSI, to, to please come on the desk. Next, I invite the uh, Secretary, Organizing Secretary, NeuroVascon 2023. I request the organizing chairman of NeuroVascon 2023, Dr. Daljeet Singh, to please kindly come and deliver a few words. And start the validatory closing ceremony.
So like every good thing, it has to come to an end. Doing so, it is quite possible that despite our efforts, there must have been some deficiencies on our part in imparting the, the services which we actually wanted to. So I personally take the onus on me for any kind of a failure which has happened uh, by our team in uh, fulfilling the expectations uh, from the delegates. Anyway, thank you so much. For the for the award distribution. Now the I will declare the awards. Uh, there are three awards in the paper presentations, and the first award goes to. And uh, the next award go to Srijita Sri Kumar. Is he there, Srijit? And the third award goes to Dr. Aske Khan. Okay. Now we'll move on to poster awards. There are two awards. The first award goes to Dr. Mahesh Mahajan. Is he there? Big round of applause for him. And the last award goes to Dr. Binita Dholakia. Is he there? Is he there? Let me give my uh, talk, then we will have a uh, At the outset, I will request all the delegates, faculties, international and national, to stand up to give a standing ovation to Dr. Anita Jagatia for her excellent arrangements for this conference. Why I am forced to? Because it was excellent scientific papers, excellent food, good ambience. There is initial hiccups in audiovisual, but it was very rightly corrected. And there is maximum number of registration for the conference, for the workshop, and highest number of paper, highest number of international and national faculty, highest number of membership, which is very important for me. <laughs> so, with these few words, I hope the CVA Society move forward with a better performance next time. Thank you, Anita. <laughs> then I will request uh, our chief guest, Professor Sano, and uh, to say a few words followed by Dr. Mark. First of all, all organizing committee and also the uh, uh, video assistant, 
and everybody and congratulations of the very successful meeting and uh, very nice uh, the, the, uh, uh, um, uh, I mean uh, 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 so sophisticated everything <laughs> yes one and uh, also and uh, uh, some survivors and and we uh, remembering of the first time maybe the, uh, the, the level of the, the neurovascular surgery in India is uh, the 40 years before it just coming up now I uh, now it coming up to, to those almost and sometimes I cannot understand maybe you are beyond me and then uh, so uh, we uh, we hope you will be bigger and bigger and then uh, to be on to my po position and then to be the, the, the control to, to the world. And so next time we would like to see it in uh, Jaipur. Before I request uh, my colleagues of the society, Dr. Manmohan, I'll request Dr. Choudhury Dr. Kishore Choudhury, sir, if you have something to say for this conference, and Dr. Uh, Dr. Venon. All international faculty, if they can. Huh? First of all, it's been a pleasure to come to Delhi. I came to Delhi after almost 20 years and uh, it's changed so much and uh, it was not only a pleasure to visit the city but to attend such a, a wonderful conference uh, which is probably better than any other vascular conference I've attended so far. As far as the hospitality is concerned uh, and the organizing program uh, right from juniors and seniors, uh, I think it was par excellence and more than teaching and training, I think I'm going back having learned a number of things, both technical and non-technical, both surgical and endovascular. And that is what has kept me here for all two and a half days I've been here uh, attending almost every session of the program because I just could not take my foot out of the, 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 the sessions, uh, the seminar room. Uh, I would like to thank uh, not only the Cerebrovascular Surgical Society, but especially Dr. Daldit and Dr. Anita for their kind invitation. And when we come from abroad, it's a lot of stress, right from getting leave, funding, coming here, jet lag, tired, you're looking after your duties there and here. So it is a stressful event for us, but they have made it absolutely a pleasure and comfort and not only a training feast in neurovascular surgery, but also a very pleasurable and memorable holiday for us to remember for a long time. Thank you very much for your Thank you very much. I cannot be as eloquent as uh, Kishore. Uh, he said everything, and thank you very much for uh, the invitation, uh, Dr. Anita, Dr. Daljit, and all the committee. And thank you very much for all of you who are helping like mad all the time. Uh, of course, the standard is very high. This is my third time. And uh, we go to a lot of uh, other meetings. No doubt the technical ability and the progress here, you, know, you don't see it anywhere else. I've been here three times. And the technical ability has been increasing really very hard, the, uh, very quick, I mean, and the progress is incredible. I, of course, enjoyed the scientific content, the hospitality, but what I enjoyed that cannot be, that is priceless, is the sense of belonging here. And I really felt I belong to, to all of you, and it was a great time. Thank you so much. I, I please request the treasurer of CVSI, Dr. Manmohan Singh, please kindly come forward and address us. Uh, 
on the behalf of Cerebral Vascular Society of India, I would like to thank the organizers, uh, Professor Daljeet Singh, Dr. Anita Jagatia, for organizing such a wonderful conference, very well attended. I think this is uh, a feast for the neurovascular surgeons and a lot of deliberation for the endovascular as well as the surgical uh, expertise mm -hmm. of the various person across the world which actually every delegate had, uh, I, I hope that they must have learned so many things from this new conference. So uh, I thank all the delegates to come here to honor us and uh, to, so that this society progresses and it is a source of learning for uh, all of us and we actually interact and so that we mutually learn from each other. I thank you again, sir, for uh, organizing such a wonderful conference. Thank you. I would like to thank all our delegates. Uh, I would request you all to be, please be seated for a group photo. And before that, uh, I would like to invite the secretary, organizing secretary of uh, NeuroVascon 2023, Dr. Yeah, Dr. Anita Jagetia, to kindly please come and deliver the vote of thanks. Before uh, Dr. Anita speaks, I'll just tell you all that 2024 NeuroVascon is in Rajas uh, Jaipur. So, like this conference, try to join in large number, basic, uh, preferably the youngsters. They should join in large number and do the research work from now and present in the conference. Yeah, so it is the end of two and a half day journey and almost a year preparation by a big cavalry of senior residents, 18 residents, but uh, it was like 3,600 cavalry army. So a big applause for the, all the residents who really tirelessly worked <laughs> over last uh, more than a month. And uh, mm, uh, special thanks to Dr. Harkaran also. And because of him, you never thought that, uh, how will you be picked up, how will you be dropped, where to go, how to go. And uh, in fact, we all have learned a lot from the residents uh, to carry out things seamlessly. And of course, the AV team, and uh, because uh, we all know there are deficiencies in any program which you start. And uh, there have been deficiencies in this uh, meeting also. But, and uh, I apologize for all those deficiencies which has happened and which has created some problems to the people. And thankful to all the national, international faculty, Dr. Kishore, Dr. Ramesh, Dr. Carlos, all Japanese team, and uh, the people who have come from uh, all parts of India as well uh, to make this uh, meeting successful. And thankful to all the uh, exhibitors, even after this um, glitches, which has the problems which has happened because of the NMC, they made this event happen successful. Thank you all. Thanks. Uh, thank you very much for being here and make this conference successful. Thank you all.